And before we start the meeting, I would like all members to observe a minute's silence in memory of Councillor Bernard Hunt, whose death we mourn. Thank you. I'm just going to say a few words first, and then Councillor Matthews and one of my colleagues will then say words as well. It is with great sadness that I heard of the death of Councillor Bernard Hunt. He had been involved as a councillor, town and county councillor, for about 40 years, a very fine achievement. When Herefordshire Council was first formed, he became the first leader of the independent group. He was also a long serving and well respected member of the West Mercia Police Authority. And lastly, he served on the planning committee and was assiduous in his research and preparation and always made a useful contribution to debate. He was always friendly, polite, and a good companion and a good advisor. He will be much missed. We send our condolences to his family in this sad time. I now call upon Councillor Matthews, who wishes to say some words. Thank Councillor you, Matthews. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman, Bernard was a staunch Erefordian, and he served the residents, residents of this county at various levels, as, as you said, for near on 40 years. He always made people feel he had time for them and went out of his way to help and advise newly elected members. He always had a smile on his face and I never once witnessed him losing his cool. He was a true gentleman in every sense. I used to speak to him most every day and I did last Tuesday morning because he had a wealth of experience regarding local government and it was always, <clears throat> and we always firstly discussed our approach to key issues. He informed me, informed me that he had an appointment that afternoon at Belmont to meet some of his constituents. And it was after that when he returned to his car that sadly he collapsed and passed away. So he was serving his constituents to the very last. I have noted colleagues at sad times like this, fellow councillors and members of staff unite and show so much kindness and support and place politics aside, that is warmly welcomed. Bernard was a great friend and loyal colleague of mine, <clears throat> and he will be greatly missed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Matthews. That's a very heartfelt tribute. And I'd like to call upon Councillor Lester. Councillor Lester, are you, are, you, are you here? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? I know you want to say some words. Yes, can you hear me? Hear yeah, you well, thank you. Yes, yes. Well, on behalf of the Conservative group, we offer our deepest sympathies to Councillor Hunt's wife and family and all of those that were close to him. Um, some of you will not have had the much of an opportunity to become acquainted with him because um, some of the councillors on the council have been newly elected. Um, but, it, you know, it was so significant to note that Bernard has been a councillor for decades and served lots of different communities and dedicated most of his life to representing people. 
there are few councillors that will have put so much time and energy into representing people. I personally have known Bernard for a very long time and he was full of encouragement for me when I started out in my career in representing people and I learned much from him. What I admired about him the most, which has already been said, is that he was calm and he would be very dispassionate in the way he would get his points across. You would not always agree with him, but we will always be impressed by the way he conducted himself in public and the way he always respected other councillors in the midst of a debate. I think it is also very typical of Bernard to have been working so hard right up until the end, even though he was obviously very ill. And this is a testament to how dedicated he was in his role as a ward councillor. I know that he will be a great loss to his party and this council will have also lost the benefit of his wisdom and experience. And so it, by this sudden news, it is a poignant moment to note that we have this opportunity to pay tribute to a councillor who has spent so much of his life in the service of others. Thank you, Councillor Lester. Very well said words. Uh, councillor Selden, I believe you'd like to say a few words as well. If I may, Chairman, that'd be very kind. Um, Bernard was not only a Herefordian, he was a Bromyardian from a well-known Bromyard family. And he and his brother, Tom, served on this council for many years and on the town council for well over 40 years. And indeed, it's probably his fault that you're having me sitting here today because he encouraged me to stand first in 2007 when I first became elected for this seat in Bromyard. He'll be remembered by the community in Bromberg for a whole variety of reasons, but um, he had many followers of his TV repair business, which he uh, trade which he'd learnt um, during his national service, I understand. He could turn on the charm like a tap, and uh, I could, you could see people melt in front of him. They could also do awful one-liners and puns, and then revel in the groans that followed um, <laughs> in, in, in the, the, the awfulness of what he was said. And he would just smile and say, yeah, there you go. But he was also a very shrewd political operator. And um, I'm sure that's a talent that will be missed because he knew exactly which fights to pick and which ones to leave alone. Um, and our condolences go to all his family and friends. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Selden. Again, very good words. Councillor Hitchener, I believe you'd like to say some words as well. Yes, I'll, I'll be uh, brief. Um, I'm one of those councillors who, who uh, have only recently started, and I would I would say of, of, of Bernard that he was always courteous. Um, he always had a smile, and he always had a word of encouragement. So uh, if I was uh, coming out of a council meeting, he would always always say something really positive, and I do thank him for that, and my condolences to his family. Thank you very much. Councillor Hitchener. Again, well said. Uh, we'll now start the formal part of the meeting, I think, and I will go to each Chairman. member of the cup. Sorry? Sorry, may I say a few words on behalf of the Green Group? Sorry, yes, of course you may. I just hadn't, uh, we hadn't heard from you that you wanted to speak, that's all. I not, not, wasn't trying to uh, put you down in any way at all. Councillor Chance, please, on you go. Thank you, Chair, and sorry, I don't want to extend too much, but just on behalf of the Green Group, I wanted to express our shock and sadness at the death of Councillor Bernard Hunt. And as, as people have said, we, we also recognise his contribution to public life in the county as a councillor of many years standing. I understand that he represented Bromyard as well as Hereford and also Malvern Hills District Council, Hereford City Council, as well as uh, working with us more recently. And we, we know how much he cared about his residents, as was demonstrated by the fact that he was serving them on the day that he so sadly died. Um, and echoing comments that others have made, many of us have kind of um, spoken amongst ourselves about how much we appreciated how friendly he was towards fellow councillors. So he will be missed, I think, by all of us. And um, we just wanted to send our sympathy and our warmest wishes to, to all of his family at this sad time. Thank you. Th thank you, Councillor Jones. I'm sorry I, I missed you out. One person we do want to hear from also is Councillor James, I think is now in the room. 
thank you, Chairman. I just, uh, I won't go on to great length. I've known Bernard Props uh, longer than most people on the, this particular council. Before Herefordshire Council existed, he was a member of Morven Hills District Council, and I occasionally met him in those days. Uh, but when Herefordshire came into formation, he was leader of the independent group, the single independent group that existed in those days. Um, and he, it was the second largest group on the, on the council, and he worked in support of the formation of Herefordshire Council, uh, dutifully and loyally, and always with good grace. One thing, we've all got faults, but the one thing um, Bernard has was a, a, a pleasant manner and an ability to, to not speak ill of his fellow councillors or fellow community members. In all the years I knew him, I never heard him slagging off an individual member or, or uh, speaking ill of an individual member. And for that, which is a rare thing in, in politics, it's a funny old game, uh, I shall long remember him and speak for, uh, fee, uh, think fondly of him. My condolences to his family, and uh, I hope uh, they get over the loss in time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor James. Well, well said again. Do we have anyone else who wishes to speak? Just in case I've missed anyone. If not, I think we've had some very moving and fine tributes to Thank Councillor Hunt. Councillor Wilding, you wish to speak, right? Councillor Wilding? Thank you, yes. I just wanted to say, once again, echo everybody's um, comments. I too am a new councillor, uh, but every time I talked to Bernard, uh, he was very encouraging and he had a brilliant little twinkle in his eye, um, which I'll always remember. So um, my condolences to his family as well. Thank you, Councillor Wilding. I know you've all only recently been elected, but that's, he obviously made a, a, a good impression upon you, and that's very comforting, I think, and we'll all remember that. If we have no more speakers, we will go to the formal start of the meeting, and I will go to each member of the council to confirm that they can hear and be heard. This is a legal requirement for me to do so. Please verbally confirm that you are able to hear me, and I will confirm in response that I can hear you. Councillor Graham Andrews. I can hear you, Chairman. Thank you, I can hear you and see you too. Councillor Paul Andrews. I can hear you, Chairman. Thank you, I can hear you and see you. Councillor Polly Andrews. I can hear and see you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor, I can hear and see you as well. Councillor Jenny Bartlett. I can hear and see you, Chairman. Thank you, I can hear and see you as well. Councillor Chris Bartram. Yes, I can see you and hear you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor, I can see and hear you also. Councillor Christy Bilderson. Well, good morning, Chairman, I can hear and see you. I can see and hear you as well, and good morning to you also. Councillor Dave Bolter. Do we have Councillor Dave Bolter? No sign? Is he in the room? Councillor Dave Bolter? I think we may have to pass on. He's struggling to connect, I think, Chairman. I believe so. Uh, we might come back to Councillor Dave Bolter, I think. See if he's got him, himself in touch. We'll try and get him back in. He may have dropped out temporarily. Councillor Tracy Bowes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I can see and hear you. Thank you. And good morning to you as well. I can see and hear you too. Councillor Ellie Chans. Morning, Chair. I can hear and see you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Councillor. And thank you. And I can hear and see you as well. Councillor Pauline Crockett. Morning, Chair. Yes, I can hear and see you. And good morning to you. And I can hear and see you as well. Councillor Gemma Davis. Good morning, Chair. Thank you for that lovely tribute to Councillor Hunt. I can see and hear you. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Davis. It's, it's, it's good to have your words in, in response. Very kind of you to say so. Uh, Councillor, and I can see and hear you too, I should say that as well. 
Councillor Barry Durkin is, I believe, absent today. Uh, Councillor Tony Fagan. Councillor Fagan. I did see you on screen before. I can see and hear you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Good morning to you. I can see and hear you now. Thank you. Councillor Elizabeth Foxton. Good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Good morning, and I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Carol Gandhi. I can see and hear you, Chairman. I can see and hear you too, Councillor. Councillor Kima Guthrie. Good morning, Chairman. I can see and hear you. I can see and hear you too. Good morning to you. Uh, Councillor John Hardwick. Uh, good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Good morning to you. I can see and hear you as well. Councillor John Harrington. Good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Thank you. I can see and hear you too. And Councillor Liz Harvey. Morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Good morning, Councillor. I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Jenny Hewitt. Thank you, Chair. I can see and hear you. Good, I can see and hear you too. Councillor Kath Hay. Good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Good, I can see and hear you too, and good morning to you. Councillor David Hitchener. Good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Good morning, Councillor. I can see and hear you too. Councillor Philip Howells. Good morning, Chairman. Yes, I can see and hear you. Good morning to you, and I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Helen Ianson. Good morning, Chairman. I can see and I can hear you. Good morning, and I can see and hear you too, Councillor. Councillor Terry James. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. I can see and hear you. Good morning, Councillor James. I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Peter Ginman. Good morning, Chairman. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Good morning, Councillor. I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Tony Johnson. Good morning, Chairman. I can see and hear you. Good morning, Councillor. I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Graham Jones. Morning, Mr. Chairman. I can see and hear you. Good morning, Councillor. I can see and hear you as well. <coughs> Councillor Mike Jones. Yeah. Good morning, Chairman. I can see and hear you. Very good. Thank you, Councillor. And good morning to you. See and hear you also. Councillor Jim Kenyon. Councillor Jim Kenyon. Good morning, Chairman. I'm sure you can see where I'm sat in your office. I thought about staging a coup and uh, staying in your office until the phone out roads open, but I'm sure you can hear me, and I think I've made a little point there. Uh, good morning, Councillor. I can see and hear you as well. I hope you don't try and have a coup. It's just not very nice weather for coups today. Uh, Councillor Jonathan Lester. Thank you, Chairman. I can see and hear you. Uh, can I just say Councillor Milmore is having internet uh, problems, so he has not been able to join the meeting. Thank you. I hope you can join us later. Uh, Councillor, Councillor, I can see and hear you, and good morning to you. Councillor Trish Marsh. Good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Marsh. I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Bob Matthews. Yes, good morning, Chairman. I can see and hear you. And Chairman, as I explained yesterday, I might have to leave the meeting in the next quarter of an hour. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming this morning and giving your tribute. That is much appreciated. And we can see and hear you at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Mark Milmore, I believe, is having problems. Uh, so we will come back to him, perhaps. Councillor Jeremy Milne. As Councillor Hunt will have characteristically said, this is my great pleasure to see and hear you. And so it is. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Jeremy Milne. And we can see and hear you too. <clears throat> and it is a pleasure to see you. Councillor Felicity Norman. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I can see and hear you. I can see and hear you too, Councillor. Councillor Roger Phillips. I can see and hear you, Chairman. Good, I can see and hear you too. Thank you. Councillor Tim Price. I can see and hear you, Chairman. Excellent, I can see and hear you too. Thank you. Councillor Paul Roan. Uh, morning, Chair. I can uh, hear you and see you. And a special good morning to uh, Radio Free Phone. Hope look loud and direct from your office. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rowan. I can see and hear you as well. Councillor Alan Silden. With sound and vision. Good morning, Chairman. <laughs> good morning, Councillor. Good to see you and hear you. Uh, Councillor Nigel Shaw. 
Can we good see morning, Chair. You? I can hear and see you, but I do have ongoing problems with the internet connection. Thank you, Councillor Shaw. Good morning to you, and it's good to see you and hear you so far. I hope we retain the link. Uh, Councillor Lewis Stark. Yes, morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Good morning to you, and we can see and hear you as well. Councillor John Stone. Councillor Stone. Did see you earlier on. Good morning. Councillor John Stone. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I can see and hear you. Thank you, Councillor Stone. I can see and hear you too, and good morning to you. Councillor David Summers. Good morning. I can see and hear you. And good morning to you, and we can see and hear you as well. You've got a very strong backlight behind you, which rather puts your face into darkness, unfortunately. Councillor Elissa Swinglehurst. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. I can hear and see you. Good morning, Councillor Swinglehurst. We can see and hear you as well. Councillor Paul Simons. Yes, good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Good morning to you, and we can see and hear you as well. Thank you. Councillor Kevin Tillett. Good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. We can see and hear you too, and good morning to you. Councillor Diana Toynbee. Good morning, Chair. I can see you and hear you. Good morning, Councillor. We can see and hear you as well. Councillor Ange Tyler. Good morning, Chair. I can hear you and see you as well. Thank you. Good morning to you, and we can see and hear you also. Councillor Yolandi Watson. Good morning, Chair. I can hear you and see you. Thank you. Good morning. I can't see you at the moment. Oh, I can now. I can see you and then hear you now. Good morning to you. Councillor William Wilding of the Short Haircut. Thank you, Chair. I can hear and see you, and I can hear you easily now. The hair is no longer open. <laughs> Not blocking the orifices. That's good. Good morning to you. Yes. Uh, good morning to you, and we can see and hear you. Councillor Dave Bolter. Can we see and hear you? I can see and hear you. Sorry, audio problems earlier on. Now fixed. Good. Thank you. Glad to see you're here now, and uh, we can see and hear you as well. Thank you. Functioning well. Thank you. Excellent. And Councillor Milmore, is he has he appeared yet? Not he's not on the list apparently. We'll have to wait for him to clock in if he can. I hope he can. One of the disadvantages of having online Zoom meetings, you can't guarantee the technology. Right. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's virtual meeting. We'd have to go through the same process as before, reading out the whole dialogue, monologue. The council is video and audio streaming this meeting live on the internet and making an official recording. The recording forms part of the public record of the meeting. Please note that it is a legal requirement that every member attending virtual meetings is able to hear and where practicable, see and be heard and where practicable, be seen by the other members in attendance and the public watching. So I ask that you please have your audio switched on and where you are able to do so, you also have your video enabled. For virtual meetings, there are a number of additional points for members of the council and officers to be aware of. As part of our meeting etiquette and in line with our normal committee practices, all microphones, apart from mine, will be placed on mute at the start and during the meeting. Democratic services will invite members to unmute their microphones to contribute to a debate where a member has raised their virtual hand or a point of order. Where members exceed the time limit for speeches, their microphone will be placed on mute after a brief period of grace. When you wish to speak, Please use the blue hand button against your name in the participants list, which should be on the right of your screens. I will then invite you to speak in order of hands being raised. Private chat has been enabled for this meeting. Please can members ensure that the facility is only used to communicate with me as the chairman via Mr. Coleman, to raise a point of order or to explain that you need to leave the meeting. We will be using electronic voting again. All members must vote to ensure the validity of the polls taken. If it is not possible to confirm that all members have voted, 
then I will go to those individual members who have been unable to vote to receive a verbal vote. Following this, if we are still unable to confirm all members have voted, the vote will be relaunched. If any named votes are requested at today's meeting, they will be conducted by roll call. And I think we have it there. We are following the procedure which we are, I hope we're now getting used to. And I'm very glad to see that the last time our electronic voting went very well indeed. And that's due to all your hard, hard practice. And thank you for attending for that. Now come to agenda item three, the minutes, pages nine to 16. Oh, sorry, apologies for absence. Right, yes, have we apologies for absence? Yes, I received apologies from Councillor Durkin. Are there any other apologies? Councillor Lester? Sorry, I was just indicating that you'd got uh, the apologies from Councillor Durkin. Yes, sorry, thank you very much. Um, we have no more from Councillor Milmore yet. And item two, to receive declarations of interest. We, the next item is to receive any declarations of interest by members in respect of items on this agenda. If any member does need to leave the meeting while an item is discussed, they will be placed in the virtual meeting room until the item has been concluded. Members who have declared an interest and withdrawn from the meeting will be readmitted to the meeting once the item has been concluded. Do any members have any interests to declare? No, me, no declarations of interest? Fine. Sorry, I turned a page too soon. Didn't I? Item three, minutes, pages nine to 16. To approve and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of September, 2020. I will shortly ask the council to confirm the minutes of the meeting on the 11th of September. And I note that the monitoring officer has not received any challenges to the accuracy of the minutes by the deadline of 9.30 a.m. this morning. The voting options for, against, and abstain have been added to the electronic voting options. The options are now on screen. If you are unable to see the voting options, please access the poll icon at the bottom of your screen. Can Democratic Services confirm the voting number and that all members are available and ready to vote? Chairman, there are 50 members eligible to vote and they may vote now. So please can members vote for, against or abstain. And remember, please cast your vote and ensure you press submit after selecting the option for which you are voting. Are all the votes in? Yes. Four, 46, against, sorry? Oh, it's 48. Four, four, 48, against, zero, abstentions, two. So the minutes are carried. Thank you. Now come to the item four, Chairman and Chief Executive's announcements. The Chairman's announcements are set out in the agenda papers. And they're fairly brief, as the last meeting was fairly recent, and we haven't had so many meetings to go attend outside because of this COVID, as you may notice. Uh, I do like to, would like to say, though, that I went on the 20th of September to the Battle of Britain service in Hereford Cathedral. It was a very impressive service, and the RAF cadets were immaculately turned out and spoke excellently. A great credit to their the RAF and to their schools and commanding officers. It was a very fine service. I also made a visit to Enmite at Blackfriars, the new university. I was taken around by one of the professors and I was much impressed by the state of art and the high quality of their, of their equipment and their very positive approach to teaching and learning and particularly the way they were learning in groups and teams and the whole, whole method was very much geared towards practical, realistic work that will fit them for 
industry and the wider world in a very, very effective way, I do believe. So I look forward to seeing Enmite flourishing. I think they are making a good start. Certainly their premises at Blackbriars are very impressive. Item five, questions from members of the public. There have been seven questions submitted under this item. The questions and responses have been published as a supplement. Members of the public who have submitted a question have been offered the opportunity to ask a supplementary question by email, an audio or video link, or as a virtual participant. A supplementary question must relate to the original question raised or response provided and is time restricted to one minute. We have Mr. Connard as our first questioner, and I believe you think he's being admitted now. Mr. Connard. He's just just wait. Don't get too excited. Mr. Connard. Hi, yes, I just said getting person. someone away in the background who was making a noise. <laughs> Off you go. What is your supplementary question? Okay, firstly, thank you for answering uh, my initial question. Um, I note in the answer it says that as part of the development process, ward members, town and city councillors, local businesses, traders, transport providers, and other organisations were consulted on the, pro uh, the process. Uh, indeed, we did have an email, and, and indeed, I did reply to that. Uh, however, uh, on, a uh, on a meeting on the Castle Green with other retailers, I understand that uh, Councillor John Harrington uh, admitted in his words that the consultation over these measures uh, were shit. Um, and so I, I would tend to agree with that uh, because um, the measures brought in have mostly been removed uh, and cancelled. Um, so uh, I also then had uh, contact with Liz Harvey uh, unfortunately, this wasn't such a good experience as the contacts that we had with John Harrington, who uh, was certainly very helpful and, and offered to meet with uh, businesses. Uh, initially, Liz Harvey didn't mention she was a councillor and uh, then commented a couple of times on social media posts. And it was only when I called her out uh, that she finally she admitted she was a councillor. Uh, she was extremely rude and unprofessional and discourteous to me and other members of the public who commented. Initially, this surprised me. However, I then looked at her Facebook profile. Uh, Mr. Collard, can we, can we go to the however, question, please? Oh, yes, I will, yeah. However, on her Facebook profile, it says, never ever trust a Tory. They shit everywhere. And I'm not sure that is in line with the Herefordshire Council Code and Guides, Part 5, Section 9, updated on the 19th of May, 2017, uh, which makes it clear the, uh, the roles and responsibilities of councillors. Um, so uh, that, that experience was very, uh, very uncomfortable. I then uh, dealt with Jeremy Mine uh, again. Can we, can we come to the question, please? I have, yes, I'm just coming to that, sir. Please. Yeah. It was a very disappointing experience. Initially, he tried to avoid helping me altogether. Uh, it was only when I pointed out his duty as a councillor, he even engaged with me and has still not answered any of my questions and was very patronising and offensive. So my question to you, sir, is that uh, I believe that Liz Harvey and Jeremy Mine uh, are in breach of the uh, codes and guidelines as a councillor. So uh, I presume it's your job to ask them to resign uh, or your job to uh, fire them. Uh, and as these issues happened on your watch and you were ultimately responsible, uh, isn't it time if you're not prepared to do either of those that you considered your position? Uh, thank you, Mr. Connard. I am the civic leader of the council. I'm not the, uh, the, shall we say, the political leader. And I'm going to point you to Councillor Hitchener, who will respond to your comments. But thank you for your comments. Councillor Hitchener. Yes, I, I, I was trying to unmute myself, but I only just managed that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, right. Just the, I guess the point of order, Chairman, uh, we haven't had the Chief Exec Executive's announcements. I don't know whether that's an omission. Oh. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, there, are, there aren't any. Sorry, I should have... Aren't any. Okay, that. thank you very much. 
I, I do. Uh, that, that's an omission on my part, and I apologize for it. But there were not any. If there had been, I would have made okay. them very clear. Um, so, Mr. Connard, um, I, I'm not really quite sure whether you should be using this forum as a, an opportunity to make personal attacks on on my fellow councillors. Um, they obviously have a right to reply, and it's a matter, really, I think, for the chairman whether he. He wants to allow um, both Mr. Harr Councillor Harrington and Councillor Harvey and Cassie Mill all to, to uh, jump in with this or deal with it through the council's formal complaints procedure, which might be a more civil way of dealing with it. Um, so I think perhaps, can I leave it a little bit to the chairman and, and the monitoring officer to use their discretion as to whether we want to uh, divert this meeting to, to that? Um, of course, it's a little disappointing you, you've... Um, you raised a question about uh, the, the traffic measures uh, and then you use your supplemental to, to, to launch a personal attack. I, I, I just don't think that's the way we want to be doing politics in Herefordshire. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, as leader, thank you for your words. And I think the correct methods are laid out in, in the constitution mm -hmm. as to how complaints against councillors should be laid. And I suggest those procedures are followed. Um, I'm certainly not in a position to go and fire anybody, nor do I think it right and proper to even consider that in my position. Um, but I'm sure you will, if you ring up and find out the procedures you should be following, that is your route. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Connolly. Chairman, may I just interject there? I think I don't think it's necessary for Mr. Connolly to uh, to actually go through a process. He has lodged, lodged a complaint. Uh, and I think we should be treating it uh, as, as a complaint without asking him to go through all that sort of process. Um, it seems to me as if that's sort of kicking it into the grass uh, and putting an extra hurdle. I think when there are complaints, we should be honest about it and dealing with it. He has laid it out. There's a rec recording of what he said. Um, uh, and I would ask that to, to go forward without him necessarily having to, to, to go through another hurdle. Thank you. I'm just going to consult with the, my legal officer. Uh, the form must have been sent to him to make a formal complaint. So we'll see what happens. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, second question, Mr. Thomas. I have a supplementary question, which I'll read out to you. It would appear from the statement that the advice provided the council is flawed, as it is apparent the authority had, firstly, assumed a slip plane was present. This is not the case. Secondly, believed upslope groundwater threatened the stability of the wall. This is not the case. And thirdly, had not maintained the wall as part of regular maintenance of infrastructure assets, as other such walls in the county are being. Is the council therefore aware that as all structures yield under load, that lime water is ideally placed if maintained to ensure the long-term stability of an old wall, as lime water can accommodate heave the migration of water and self-heal as they recalcify in air. Whilst it is apparent BBLP appear to offer up overly technical and overly engineered solutions without knowledge or understanding of historic lime water structure, perhaps BBLP can be encouraged to go on a course to understand the care and maintenance of lime water structures, if only to help save the council millions of unnecessary expenditure and the disruption to the wider public. Councillor Harrington, it's all yours. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, um, I've had some correspondence with Mr. Thomas. Um, he is an architect. He's not a civil engineer. Um, but I do, I do respect his efforts in, in, in offering an alternative opinion of the failure at Stone Cottage. And I have asked Clive Hall, one of our technical officers, to engage in conversation with him. The basic difference in opinion if we just boil it down to a simple uh, a simple few words is that Balfour Beatty with their consultants WSB have undertaken geotechnical work which essentially said that due to the rain and the pressures on the soil behind the wall the wall moved as a result of those movements. Mr Thomas seems to think that because the wall was poorly maintained, and I'm not sure if it was or it wasn't. I, I wouldn't want to argue at that point. 
because the wall was poorly maintained, the wall essentially moved rather than being moved. And this, this is a point that has gone backwards and forwards. Uh, and as I say, I have to defer to the technical ability of a large civil engineering firm and several studies and geotechnical work against his opinion. But that's not to say that I discard his opinion. And I've told him in correspondence that I don't discard his opinion. And I have said, because this whole issue of found hope has gone on far longer than I would have liked to have, to have done, that we will look at every aspect of this once the work is done. And if there are things that should have been done better, and if there were things that weren't done as well as they were should have been done, there will be consequences for all involved. At the moment, my focus is on making sure this work is done as quickly as possible. We have contractors engaged. We have a very complicated geotechnical solution, which will be, which took eight odd weeks to design. The work will begin shortly. BT are clearing the site and uh, reconnecting the cables, including quite a lot of heavy cabling that connects the broadband for the hospital, a very delicate project. So I hope we will be ready and the road will be open by February, if not slightly before, if we can get some, some uh, single lane usage. But I, I, I will continue to engage with him on this. I'm happy to, uh, you know, he, he has made a great effort um, to, to point, put across his point of view. I'm concerned that he's very certain about his point of view on, on very little technical evidence other than his own architectural background. But that doesn't mean, as I said, that I just discount it in the slightest. Uh, and just on the issue of found hope, I, you know, I, I noticed Councillor Kenyon made, you know, uh, you know a, a comment, and I, you know, <laughs> that's Jim, and I love Jim. Councillor wrote a comment as well, but I think that's less, less lovely, because I don't think it's funny that 10 years of austerity have left us with crumbling infrastructure. I don't think it's funny that our national government hasn't given us the money to do this work, and that we've had to go and borrow for it. Uh, and I don't think it's funny that the previous administration didn't put Balfour Beatty through a value manual for contract for all the periods that uh, they were in control of the, of the council. So populism is the very worst kind of politics. It's, it's a responsible job and it's not easy, always an easy job. And those with the responsibility have to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harrington. Um, and then we come to the supplementary question from Mr. Mackay. Uh, the DEC Streets version 4.1, section 8.1, says that the aspiration is to move to a single electronic recording method. With it expected that this local street gazetteer guidance will develop, with it being anticipated that local street gazetteers will form one of the data sets used to protect highways from extinguishment under the provisions of the Crow Act 2000 in 2000 to 2026. The local street gazetteer is the most comprehensive data set, and if these blue anomaly triangles could also be shown on this web on this and website updated, we could expect to see the highway records in clearest format, minimizing gaps, overlaps, and duplications of work being undertaken to meet the 2026 cutoff date. Councillor Harrington, is your happy pleasure again? Whatever questions Mr. Mackay has sent us, they have been useful and we have acted upon them. I suspect we'll be doing the same on this and I shall give him an update. Thank you. Uh, fourth question from Mr. Williams concerning 5G masts. Many countries and counties within the UK are banning 5G until sufficient tests have been carried out to ensure it is safe. Ultimately, as Councillor Bob Matthews asked the question last year at full council, but to date have had no response. Can you tell us what is Herefordshire's position on 5G and who will be held responsible for the effects on health and well-being, mental and physical, when these masks are sighted in close proximity to schools and public open spaces, especially as children are more susceptible to the effects of electromagnetic fields? And Councillor Crockett, I think this is your question to answer. Thank you, Chairman. You're so kind. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's nice to be able to have this opportunity in between Councillor Harrington's um, forum today. <laughs> Just like to thank Mr. Williams for his question and his supplemental question. It's a, it's a very difficult situation. 
uh, we Herefordshire Council get advice from Public Health England and they're committed to monitoring the evidence applicable to this and other radio technologies. And we also revise this advice as, as necessary. We continue to monitor this, but we cannot overrule national, poli national policy, national planning policies. Sorry, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, we have Karen Wright in the room and she is our director for public health. I don't know whether she could answer any of the other uh, concerns on this supplementary question. Uh, Karen Wright, would you like to add anything to Councillor Crockett's remarks? If you're there, can you bring her in? She's on, on mute at the moment. Yeah, she, she's able to unmute. Oh, she's able. Can, 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 um, can, uh, Karen Wright. Sorry, I was giving you a demotion there to be a councillor. Uh, can you unmute yourself and make any comments you'd like to make? Thank you. Apologies, can you hear me now? Yes. I do apologise, I was trying to find the unmute this button. No, I, th I think the, the answer that we are, we do on the, the council website that we publish the latest evidence from Public Health England, and that guides the decisions um, that are taken by the council and are, are in line with the national guidance. Um, and that just provides some assurance, and um, some reassurance um, that there isn't the evidence to support that impact on um, public health that should be of concern to us. So that's all I'd like to add, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now come to a supplementary question from Mrs. Wegg Prosser. Thank you for providing the council's representation on the county's housing allocation. It is a shocking admission of their failure to deliver housing, and in particular, affordable housing. The rate of build completions in 2011 to 2020 was half the rate achieved in the decade 1991 to 2000. It seems the council is prepared to rely on the argument that in the absence of a five-year housing land supply, the housing supply can be increased simply through the presumption in favor of development. The opportunity for the council to submit a representation proposing, for example, funded mitigation of climate change, funded cleanup of the River Wye, funded social housing, and a brave build back better commitment was missed. Why did the council choose to complain about the government's proposals rather than pick them up and seize an initiative? Councillor Hitchener, this ball is in your court, apparently. No, I think it's mine, isn't it? Well, I'm not sure. I was told it could have been either of yours. You're both welcome to respond. Who's going to go first? Councillor Carrington? I'll, I'll go first. I thought it was a minor question, but if uh, the leader can certainly add to it. Um, so thank you, Mrs. Wade Prosser, for your uh, supplementary. Uh, I agree that um, we have failed to deliver housing, in particular affordable housing, over the last uh, decade. Um, and, and, you know, without wanting to sound political again, we were only in administration for uh, a half a year of that period, and it, it isn't good enough. And we as an administration are desperately keen to look at affordable housing and to build even potentially, well, we are looking at building our own affordable housing to make up for the shortfall that the private market will never cater for adequately. There are two consultations that needed to be uh, responded to. Uh, one was the changes to the existing planning, which is uh, what Mrs. Wegg Pross is relating to here. Uh, and, this, and that is exactly what it was, changes to the existing system, which was related to affordable housing and, 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 and other changes. The second one is the, is the major paper, which encompasses questions in the, the first changes to the planning um, consultation, but, but is also a complete planning for the future document. It, it aims to overhaul the entire system. And, and it is the most extraordinary um, set of proposals, I think probably for 30 odd years. Uh, it aims to simplify planning, um, whether it's for good or for bad, we don't know yet. So this is Wegg Pross's point that uh, we may not have uh, responded in the way that she's suggested that would have been uh, a good, a good, a good approach as well. From what I understood, it was a technical paper, um, and we had a second opportunity in the in the planning for the future consultation um, to catch anything that we might have missed. So 
I will speak to officers about that and I will make sure that in the major consultation that all those suggestions are considered and I thank her for her time and her, and her, and her experience. Yes, thank I'll have a few comments, I'll have a few uh, comments if I may, Chairman, yes. I, 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 um, I share your, your observations, Mr. Webb Prosser, looking at the, the number of buildings, the housing that's been built since 1991. It, it, um, in that last decade of the last century, it was 989 houses. And uh, in, in 2011 to 2020, we've only managed 475. And of course, the, the government are asking us to build a thousand or something like that. So how, how, how on earth can we do that? I don't know. And is it an unreasonable request from central government requiring us to have all this building? Uh, we do have to go back to central government and argue with them about that. One of my, my reflections is that um, we, need, we need officers to be very much on the side with, with this sort of policy and we need to give them the tools and the policies to, to run with this. And that's why we are saying to the officers, we, we are willing potentially to borrow money to help with social housing and extra building in the county. And we're working with the officers to work out a way of actually achieving that. It's, it's not a simple answer. Um, nothing, nothing about planning is. You'll be aware and the community will be aware of the white paper the government has, has produced, which is, they say, will we'll, we'll help block some of the issues with planning. Uh, we've had internal discussions about that, again, working with officers to have a common view. We, we, we are certainly not convinced by the government's uh, potential um, reduction of democracy in the way they're looking at this approach. So we need to have a look at that. So it, it is very much in our minds. Um, it's a long-term issue uh, and um, we're hoping to, to give the officers the tools and give them the enthusiasm to move ahead and, and solve these, these problems. And um, thank you for your question. It is, it is very pertinent and much appreciated. Thank you, thank you, Leader. Uh, Dr. Giesen is the next one. It was reported this week that farmers on average receive a pollution inspection from the Environment Agency every 263 years. This may strain credulity, but it illustrates that, that sorry, this, this may strain credulity, but it illustrates that letters to farmers and other potential polluters are the easy action, while the enforcement needs much more commitment and resources, and that is lacking. I'm sure Herefordshire Council planning officers do abide by the relevant legislation with planning applications, but in the light of recent revelations, isn't it time to introduce stronger supplementary planning guidance? For example, there could be a pause in determining all new applications of intensive livestock and poultry units until monitoring indicates the necessary falls in phosphate levels in waterways have happened, and or more detailed stipulations to ensure waste disposal conditions are adhered to and recognition of the cumulative effects of neighboring potential phosphate pollution sources. Councillor, Hitch, uh, Councillor Harrington, I think this is yours again. Now you can give that one to the leader. <laughs> <laughs> um, Who would like you, to answer this? One? Thank you. No, I'll answer it. Thank you. Thank you. I thought Dr. you might be. Thank yes. you, Dr. Geeson. I, I think he raises a very good point. Uh, I mean, you know, I come back to this issue of austerity again. The Environmental Agency, in my opinion, has been utterly stripped of funding over the last decade, and they have they have not had the resources to do the job that they wish to do. And they have, you know, for example, we had something like 40 monitoring systems. Uh, the EA had something like 40 monitoring systems in the Y and Lug catchments. And not, they then had four. Um, as a result of all the um, focus on, on pollution and the issues that we've dealt with over the last year and a half, they're, they're starting to increase again. But even now, as we talk about funding um, the environmental agency, we're talking about funding flood, flood prevention. And we're not talking in the same way about tackling pollution, which is a serious issue and which is prevalent across pretty much the entire country, but certainly in our rivers. Um, as planners, I mean, we, we've talked to the Environment Agency, we, they are working very hard with us. As we know, uh, Councillor Swinglehurst on the Nutrient Management Plan and the board uh, has done a fantastic job in getting both Powers Council, Herefordshire Council, Environmental Agency, Natural Resources Wales, and Natural England, and all the other agencies involved. We have made representations to our MPs 
And, and Jesse Norman particularly has been very helpful in making our case heard at national government with uh, George Eustace and DEFRA. So we are getting a response to, to the pollution that we see in our rivers. In terms of planning, what we can do is planning. We know that the rivers are the remit of the environmental agency, but we do have control as a statutory giver of permission um, over things like housing and intensive poultry units or any other livestock, intensive livestock units. We have to be careful how we interpret existing laws. Uh, we can't make our own laws up, we can't make national laws up, we have to abide to national regulations and we have to, to some extent, follow our core strategy. Our core strategy was not as robust as it should have been in relation to tackling issues of, of pollution, whether that's agricultural or wastewater from uh, sewerage plants. And we are working hard to change that. In the meantime, we can do things. And we have spoken to officers, Councillor Charles and myself and, and Councillor Swinglehurst, and we are looking at provide at, at producing supplementary planning guidance on several, several issues, including agricultural waste. And we hope that will make a difference. But it's important here not to blame anyone. The sectors, it is not the fault of a farmer or a sewerage company if they have not been properly monitored and, and properly educated and properly funded over the last decade. But we will, we will respond. We will do our best to make sure we, the changes that we want to make will start happening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Harrington. Yes, I, I have an interest in my ward very much in the pollution of the lug in particular, which is stopping development. And I, I think it's a very pertinent um, question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Paul Grape. We have your ah. According to the Hereford City Centre Transport Package Program, update of 23rd November 2017, the projected costs for the public realm components of the package, i.e., improvements to commercial road, Blue School, and New Market Streets, and the construction of a transport hub at the railway station, were professional fees, 563,000, and construction and statutory utilities, 597K. How much of the professional fees forecast have now been spent? And given the slower than expected progress on these developments, are these forecast costs from three years ago still realistic? And Councillor Harrington, is this yours again? It is, I'm afraid. Um, obviously, thanks <laughs> well for the question. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a quite a technical question, and I, I don't have those facts and figures to, to hand. Um, I will make sure that officers provide you with a response. Uh, I know he has had concerns over this, uh, and professional fees being um, capitalised or, or otherwise. Um, and I know there are also concerns over uh, previous administration using pothole revenue money to, to pay consultants. So I will, I will get answers for all of that, and I will provide a response. Thank you, and I'm sure that response will be broadcast to all our councillors as well. Thank you. And that ends the questions from members of the public. And thank you, those members of the public who sent in questions. They're always interesting, stimulating, and give us pause and cause for thought. Now, agenda item six, questions from members of the council. There have been two questions submitted by members of the council. Members are allowed one supplementary question. Supplementary questions must arise from the original question all the response provided and must not exceed one minute in length. Councillor Wilding. Thank you, you Chair. You do, good. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. I do have a supplementary and I apologise to Councillor Harrington for adding to his... <laughs> um, well, it's good so for him. Thanks for your answer, Councillor Harrington. Uh, uh, I believe it would add to the success of the Beryl Bike Scheme if it could be broadened uh, to be more inclusive. So perhaps could you set in motion some kind of research that would help the council understand how this might be achieved? Um, thanks a lot. Councillor Harrington, it is a Councillor Harrington show today, isn't it? Uh, thank you very much, um, Councillor Wilding. Um, uh, I, I think that's a very fair point and I, I'll speak to Beryl about it. Obviously we have some bikes ourselves. Um, it may be that um, as Beryl are doing so well and being so popular that that might be something they would like to sort of provide alongside us and perhaps maybe even do a more comprehensive job. So I will speak to, to Beryl. I'll speak to our officers, our very good officers about that. And I'd like to reiterate that we thank Councillor Durkin for bringing in this scheme. Thank you. 
Thank you. That's very fair comments too. And let's hope we get those improvements. Uh, Councillor Matthews, are you still here? Councillor Matthews, yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, yes, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> we all support the idea of keeping the city centre as viable as possible, but we also have a duty and responsibility to make sure we get value for money. <clears throat> Thank the leader for his response. Um, uh, leader, I understand that you've let some of these premises. Can you tell me whether they've been let at appropriate market uh, prices or you had to greatly reduce them to get tenants uh, to occupy them? Thank you. Leader, all yours. I think we look at each individual um, site. The, the uh, previous owners uh, were struggling to rent rent them at uh, full market value. Uh, we are taking a different approach. Uh, we want to get occup units occupied to show a vibrant, um, a vi vibrant project. And um, so we look at each individual case. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether it's, it's commercially confidential information. I'm, I'm wondering for guidance from the monitoring officer uh, or also the section 151 officer as to what information we can actually put out in the public domain. Is, can I have some guidance on that? Please. Um, yes, leader. It's uh, Claire Ward here. Um, I would suggest that we review what arrangements have been put in place and we can provide that to all members. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I hope that's that's we will provide that information. Um, there are a number of different elements of the, the cost, of course, on these, these sites. There is the rent, there are, are, are rates, uh, and there's a service charge element as well. Um, so I, th I think that the project washes its face fine as, as, as we took it over. So each additional unit we put in actually puts us in a stronger position financially because we will then, which of those three elements we recover, whether it's the rate, the rates or the service charge or the rent, it's at a mixed bag of the three, um, and it's a matter of which we allocate uh, to it. And we also look at the social value. So if, if the particular project is one which is going to, uh, to benefit the wider community, then we will obviously look at it more favorably than a pure commercial operation. I think if it was a multinational organization that wanted to take every unit, I'm not sure we'd be looking at, at giving them favorable terms. We would put it at the market rate, which I think is appropriate. Uh, but if it's a local operator, I think we 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 uh, we feel that we should be more sympathetic, um, and and uh, growing growing that uh, that place. Thank you, leader and chairman. I'm now leaving the meeting because I've got an urgent appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. We appreciate your attendance here, and your good words regarding Councillor Hunt. Yes, right. Councillor Milmore, I hear you've joined. Can you hear and see? I, Thank you, where Chair. are you? Yes, I'm well, here. Yes, can I, you see and hear? I can see and hear. I've had terrible internet problems this morning <laughs> and uh, I've been running around crazily trying to get the, myself into the meeting. Found an old laptop that would work with my phone. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, well done. Thank you very much. And we can see and hear you. I'm very pleased to do so as well. Thank you. And we now come to agenda item seven, rethinking governance, pages 21 to 42, to approve a governance model for Herefordshire Council. The chair of the audit and governance committee will move and introduce the report. Five minutes. Councillor Shaw, are you in a position to do so? I, I do am, so. thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I, I won't take five Good. minutes over this. Um, firstly, uh, I think we all all ought to thank uh, Councillor Christy Balderson and her working party uh, and officers from Democratic Services for delivering uh, this recommendation on the governance review on time at our October meeting, given the circumstances um, that became apparent in March this year. Uh, I note with some sadness that the late Councillor Bernard Hunt, who, who was on the working party, did not live um, has not lived to see the fruits of his labour come to council today. The working party met on 10 separate occasions to pro progress their de deliberations, so we can be satisfied that matters have been discussed 
in depth and at some length. The working party have tried to encourage all councillors to engage with the process to date and getting two thirds of councillors to respond to the consultation should give us confidence that this recommendation to council represents the majority view of councillors who expressed an opinion on this matter. Our confidence should be increased by the unanimous support by all the political groups for the recommended outcome. And I thank all members that contributed through their group consultations and the group leaders for this input. The issues uh, raised in paragraph six of this report seek to identify the primary concerns with the current model of governance. There undeniably remains a lot of detailed work ahead to flesh out the eventual form that the recommended hybrid cabinet system will take especially if all of the outcomes of paragraph 13 are to be realised. There is, as members who have studied this paper will recognise, scope for variation along the spectrum of the hybrid model, erring at one end towards cabinet and the other towards committee systems. I can only ask that members do make the effort to articulate their views by engaging with the further themed consultations, which will be carried out in the coming weeks, so that a fully detailed recommendation can be proposed for adoption by Council next May. For those that feel that the resolution does not meet their aspirations, I would say there's still an opportunity for them to input into the moulding of the final look and feel of the new structure and the way it will work. All members should take confidence in the proposal to review the implementation of the new governance model after a year of operation. After this period of isolation is over and we return to less socially distanced discourse, I do hope that legislation will provide an opportunity for us to capture the positive aspects of our new technological working practices, not only to reduce our carbon footprint, but also to enable a wider representation of Herefordshire's population to consider standing as a councillor in future elections. I hope that the working party will instill where they can, these opportunities within our new governance model. Ultimately, any governance model, any system, depends for its success on the willingness of councillors to engage with the opportunities available to them, to raise their views and concerns, to engage with the democratic process, which we cherish and protect. I commend the recommendation to council for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Shaw. I'm sure this is a very important uh, item indeed, and will have perhaps a long term effect upon the Council. Do you have a seconder? Yes, Chairman, it's Councillor Balderson. <clears throat> I wish Thank a second. You. Wish, do you wish to speak now or reserve your fire for later on? I will reserve my fire for later on, if that's okay, <laughs> please, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You will have three minutes later on then. Thank you. Now, can members please indicate if they intend to speak? And you will have three minutes each. Who have we got? Councillor Gandhi, first to go. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I support this, the recommendations from this particular report, and I thank um, Christy Borderson and all those involved in the working group um, dealing with this. I know how difficult it must be to have um, you know, considered what is such a complex issue. Um, my, I am, I am disappointed, however, that, that a third of the council didn't participate in the survey and also didn't participate in either of the four workshops that were offered at various times of the day and um, date. Um, this um, is probably one of the most important items that we were discussing for a considerable period of time, because it affects not just all of us, but it affects the way we are able to represent our residents. And the more input that we can get that allows our residents to have some influence, but also to allow our councillors who are not necessarily members of cabinet to have some form of influence on decision-making 
has to be a good thing. And I would hope going forward that the workshops that will take place, which I believe will consider each topic within our constitution, will be better supported than by two thirds of the council. Thank you, Councillor Gandhi. Uh, we now have Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chairman. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who was involved in the working group um, in uh, taking this very longitudinal um, piece of work and um, giving it all the thought and consideration that, uh, that you have done. Um, however, I do have to share um, Councillor Gandhi's uh, disappointment um, that uh, there wasn't um, wider engagement um, across the council than there was. Um, and I have to express in my personal disappointment that um, we're moving to an interim position rather than the recommendation being that we're able to move to um, a fully alternative form of um, governance for this council. Um, I spent eight years in opposition um, and stood in three elections on um, a manifesto commitment to um, move from a cabinet based decision making model to one that involved um, much more uh, deeply every single elected representative. Seven. Can we just pause there a moment? Can we pause, please? Sorry, Councillor Harvey. Technology at its most devious again. Right, we go again. A governance model that would allow every single member of uh, this council to take a full and active part in uh, the decision making process. Um, I recognise that, that everybody's got different levels of time commitment and um, different pressures um, on them in their work and home lives, but it really was my fervent hope that we would be able to get to a point where a recommendation could be solidly made for us to move to a committee based system uh, where we could all be involved um, all the time in making decisions that affect all the people who live in our county. So I am personally disappointed that we're moving to um, a hybrid system. Um, yeah, I just really wish we could have, you know, made the leap, but maybe pragmatically, um, it's a case of making a few steps in the right direction. But I know personally from being on doorsteps quite how many people across the county actually feel quite passionately about um, the need to move away from a cabinet based decision making model and that they see the committee system as, you know, giving an opportunity for them to be more accurately represented. So I am disappointed. Thank you, Councillor. We'll support you. Come to the end of your time. Thank you. We now have Councillor Harrington. Thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you, Councillor Sean, Bob, everyone involved with the governance uh, rethinking and the work that you've put in, which is, you know, as usual, done to a, a high standard and much work has gone into it. I share Councillor Harvey's disappointment that we aren't moving to a cabinet, uh, sorry, to a committee system, which is something I fully supported when I was uh, campaigning and which I've supported in principle to this day. I understand the practical difficulties around that and maybe you know, maybe maybe those were not as well understood. Um, but but I, I really do worry about us just adapting a cabinet system 
um, on the basis that it, it, it seems to me, and I may be wrong, and I'd appreciate Councillor Shaw or Councillor Bowles in correcting me on this, that, that it's really sort of left to the gift of the administration to decide within that hybrid um, cabinet model who, who from other parties, for example, gets to contribute. Because, you know, there are so many good councillors from other parties in an administration, in, in, in a council, in an authority, and to not use them or not to be able to use them see, and use them significantly uh, seems 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 a lost opportunity. We, as an administration, are happy to use good people from other parties, but, but we do that out of choice, not out of necessity. And I, I think it would be better if it was out of necessity. Often, it would take away that ability to to railroad when you shouldn't be railroading. So I would just, uh, from what I, I mean, the detail is not as great as I thought it was, but but I think what we're saying is we're, we're going to a holding position, and I presume because we aren't making any governance changes, this doesn't preclude us from looking at this again, uh, perhaps in a year's time, and deciding that we want to go further or otherwise. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Harrington, and to set your mind at rest, I think Councillor Shaw made it very clear there would be a, a review of the whole process in a year's time after, after May, so that is, I think, very sensible. Uh, Councillor Chowns, three minutes. Thank you, Chair. And first of all, I'd like to um, add my thanks to everybody who's been involved in the work, um, taking this forward in the working group. Um, it's good that we're making a, a step forward, although this is a holding position. The detail is yet to be worked out over the next six months, and I look forward to seeing what proposal comes forward to the May meeting next year. Um, I, um, I note the concerns mentioned by colleagues who'd like us to move to a, a full committee system. I think that I'd like to emphasize the positive in that we, we, we've moved quite a way already. You know, the, the work that's been done here is, is the result of the commitment of colleagues in the coalition who uh, came into the administration 18 months ago saying we did want to change the way that politics is done in Herefordshire. And this is a step along that way. It's um, so I'd like to kind of pay tribute to all of those who have pushed for us to have a more open and inclusive political culture in Herefordshire. And I think that, you know, we've shown that we're, we are making progress along along that road and that's very much to be welcomed. Um, so I, I look forward to the conversations over the next six months about exactly what the outcome will look like. I know the concerns that not everybody has participated so far. Um, I have some suggestions about perhaps how surveys could be designed to maximise um, uh, participation because sometimes uh, survey design, and this does apply to the one that, that was done for this piece of work, um, could be, yeah, changes to the design could be done to make it a bit easier for people to respond and a little more inclusive. Broadly, I think this represents um, a, a small but positive step towards building a more open and inclusive and cooperative political culture, which has to be welcomed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Uh, Councillor Wilding. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, one of the election pledges that uh, co some coalition uh, members stood on was the idea of changing the system of governments of the council from cabinet to a committee system. Uh, but as some new councillors found out, it's not that easy just to steam in and uh, change things. So I welcomed the cross-party working group looking into this, and I know they've looked in, into it in depth for several months and uh, reviewed both uh, systems and consulted with as many as if all members. Um, and what was found, I think, was that both options had their pros and cons and that perhaps, perhaps there's a third way taking the best of both systems. Um, so after all, the aim is to improve the way a modern democratic council works, not just to introduce a new system because we said we could. Um, so uh, the option presented today, I think it is, as I, I sort of echo what Councillor Chan said, it's a step forward. Maybe it's not as far as some members would like to have gone, um, but I think it's a really positive step and it shows that the coalition haven't just gone, oh, now we're in power, we'll just keep it as it is, which I think successive national governments have done um, so um, 
I welcome the fact that we've looked into how we can uh, work together with all the parties and engage and communicate and have better accountability and scrutiny and, um, and also that we'll review this in a year's time. So I think it's okay. Thank you, Councillor Wilding. Uh, Councillor James. Thank you, Chairman. There's no doubt that the majority of the Council fought on a manifesto of uh, returning to the committee system and that there's been a major U-turn as far as that's concerned. Um, the devil will lie in the detail of that. I mean, my concern is that there's an awful lot of talk about doing things and nothing really happens in the end. Any proposal, the ultimate proposal, has to be simple and understandable by the public. It's no good saying, well, we're going to get more involved, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, unless we have a fairly simple system whereby members can, if they so wish, and it appears that not all members want to be involved to that degree, can be involved and have knowledge of what, what the council is doing and how it's making the decisions and when it's making the decisions. Um, I, I, I do, I will support this particular motion, but I do warn that, you know, we don't want years of uh, looking at more and more systems. What we want is a more simple and accountable decision whereby members can be involved, albeit not ultimately necessarily taking the, the, all the decisions, but can be participate in the process. Now, it's all very well to say, oh, well, if we don't like it next year, we can do it again. We're only just over two years away from another election and another administration. And that could be abolished Im immediately or not as the case may be. The council had an opportunity to do something like introduce a committee system, but the moment it was elected, the administration, it decided well, it wasn't such a good idea after all. So, as I say, I will support the motion, but um, I have reservations as to what we might actually come up with in the end for next May. Thank you, Councillor James. Uh, Councillor Bartlett, three minutes. Thank you, Mr Chairman. <clears throat> and I too would like to say thank you to my fellow members on the task and finish group and to government support. Uh, and to all the members who did contribute to, to this piece of work. When the all members questionnaire was circulated, it came back and I, it did articulate a lot of the shared views of members' concerns. So this is a great opportunity to, to look at ourselves and articulate what we think is wrong with our system at the moment. And so increasingly, I think it's, you know, if I'm honest, I believe that we must address those concerns before we move to any further next big decisions. So this is a process. Um, and if you look at the diagram that's in the in the report, um, you can see where the hybrid uh, system does sit. And as we said, we haven't fleshed out the details. The, that's set out, uh, the process is set out in the third appendix. So I think that, you know, we, we can show that we are definitely moving towards meeting our goals of maximizing participation, member engagement in, de in decision-making and a, a process that is of decision-making that is informed, transparent and efficient. So the paper before you today does set out the basic framework for what the hybrid system will address as we move forward. So this is not the end of the process. And again, I would, I would draw members' attention to the Appendix 3, which does set out the next steps if this recommendation is accepted. And I really do hope that it will be. You know, we will be reassessing this in a year's time and we will be consulting with all members again. And I truly hope that all members will, uh, will take part in that consultation. So yes, this is a process. Yes, we are moving um, away towards a, a hybrid away from a, a cabinet as it is at the moment. And um, it's, you know, good governance is not an end result as such. It, it's, this is not a final decision 
So please let's let's stay re-engaged with this. Let's um, let's let's make a, a accept this recommendation and then move forward through the next year to actually get to a, a system that that we can all get behind. Thank you. Thank you. And now Councillor Davis, three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of things. Just firstly, um, with regards to the administration doing a U-turn, no, it was a cross-party working group. And for us to railroad something through when it hasn't gone through um, as a dem democratic um, approval isn't right. We'd be doing exactly the thing that we're seeking not to do, which is to involve everybody in decision making. So I wanted to say personally, thank you to every single person that wrote in about the uh, about the change to change to our system and especially to the people that turned up again and again and again and I know how difficult it is pulling through all of the extra information there is because there's a wealth of different systems across the whole of the UK that we could be looking at. I used to be scrutiny officer for the council a few years ago and I know from within the documentation and other research that it doesn't matter what model you are operating, it matters how you're training your councillors and how they are able to participate. So you can have that in a cabinet and scrutiny, you can have it in a committee system. It's not the actual system that matters. So what I really am impressed with is that those, those fears, those your objections as a councillor that you've got, your concerns, that's what we're really looking at in this rethinking governance and saying, what do we need to put in place to fix it? So for me, that's really important. And I think for me, I'm really grateful that Councillor Shaw said about the different ways in which we work now. For somebody that works full time, actually working virtually is much easier for them because it means they can go to their job straight afterwards. I'm going back to the hospital today after this meeting. So it's about us developing as a modern council. And I genuinely think this is the first steps towards it. But I don't want us to focus on the type of system, but I want to focus on the type of council that we are. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Seldon, three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I too take issue with Councillor James and his U-turn. Uh, I, I don't think this is a U-turn. It's a progression, as Councillor Davis has quite rightly said, and I, I remember her as, as a statutory scrutiny officer and, and admired her work as she did so. Um, I'd also like to play tribute to Councillor Balderson and Councillor Bartlett and Councillor Watson um, for the, the input they gave into this report and they worked extremely hard to get to the, this report into the way it does. Through my work with the Local Government Association, I have seen councillors that have rushed headlong into a committee system. And in, in some, some kind of answer to councillors Harvey and Harrington, I will say in the majority of those cases, they regret some of the decisions they have made to rush headlong into a committee system, which they are stuck with now for five years. What we have in this document is a hybrid system which will be under review and something that we can tweak and adjust. Now, what concerns me slightly in going forward with this is that public participation and the reasons why we sit here are to represent the public and this forum in YouTube and other electronic forums has revealed that far more people are engaging with us and hopefully listening to my words now than ever did in a physical meeting room. Now that to my mind is a huge leap forward in democratic uh, accountability. And I'm sure my inbox will be full, I hope it's full at the end of this saying, I got it wrong or I got it right from members of the public. So. I think the system that we're going to we're proposing here is the is the first stage, as many people have said, it's the first stage on a journey now to a modern, probably more electronically accountable uh, system, whereby physical meetings are not quite as important as they used to be, but electronic decision making and the way we now engage with um, the public will change as time goes forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Seldon. Councillor Crockett, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Councillor Shaw, and obviously all of the members of this uh, team who worked hard on this document. I note the strengths and weaknesses of both governance models, um, and therefore careful consideration is required. 
All members have been offered input into the proposed changes through the workshops and surveys, so therefore the decision should be an informed one. My slight concern is that several ward members have full-time employment and therefore could restrict their availability that could restrict their availability for uh, and further commitment to additional meetings. But um, on the whole, I will support this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Crockett. Admirably concise. Uh, Councillor Norman, three minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think Councillor James would have been just as critical if we had attempted to railroad this particular um, proposal through a, a cabinet a, a committee system. Um, I'm disappointed, I have to say, I agree with the people who've already spoken and said that they preferred a, a, a committee system. I was one of those who has campaigned over many years for changes and, as we would see it, a more democratic system. However, I absolutely accept that this has been looked at very, very carefully indeed. And indeed, I, I thank everyone for the really major efforts that have been made in, in, in working this through. So many thanks for that. Um, but I think what we're looking at is making what we have work in the best possible way. And that's what matters, not just the system, but making it work for everyone and ensuring that we do engage everybody, that we look for people's experience, expertise, uh, enthusiasm, and work with those in the way that's best for the council um, and you know, is, is, is going to be best for the outcomes in the long run. So I, I accept that this is a slow process that we're on our way forward, may or may not end up with the committee system some of us had hoped for, but I'm very willing to see how a possible hybrid system works and if it achieves the outcomes, which we're all keen to, to achieve, then that will be fine by me. I would just say to everyone that one of the things that's interesting is to look at what is happening in other local authorities. Councillor Seldon's mentioned, you know, possible moves that haven't always worked out for the best, but there are a number of different ways of looking at this and a number of different examples, which it, it might well be worth looking at. But broadly, I will support this and I do thank everyone involved for their commitment and, and effort. Thank you, Councillor Norman. Uh, Councillor Summers, and then Councillor Hitchener, and I hope the last one will be Councillor Andrews. Thank you, Chair. Uh, frankly, I'm still having the same issues I had last term uh, when I want something. Um, and whatever system is decided on, I think we need to remember that we're all elected by residents of Herefordshire, and those residents of Herefordshire expect us to keep them informed and help them get what they want for their tax dollar. Um, there's still a tendency for officers to pay less attention to council councillors unless they have the word cabinet attached to their name, and that's not good. Um, and it really does get very prevalent at times. Uh, I, a number of times, uh, even on my mental health stuff, is if you talk to the cabinet members, the cabinet member agree, or oh, we haven't talked to the cabinet member yet. The point is, I was elected, therefore I have a voice. And when it's not listened to by officers or anyone else, I get pretty upset. And I really not concerned of what kind of system we have. I just concerned about that we look after our residents and we do the best we can for them and we get the help to do that. And that means officers need to listen to the elected member. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Summers. Uh, we have Councillor Hitchener, Andrews and Lester as the, I hope the final brick in this particular wall. Yes, this, uh, this motion has, has my full support. I, I wasn't, wasn't elected on any particular slate as to whether things should be changed and committee um, or the current system. Um, so I'm just interested to see how, how this kind of works out. I think probably Councillor Balderson is in a fairly similar position having started with a, with a, with a, without very much background. Uh, but there are a couple of things which I'd like to, to, to achieve through this process. One is, uh, is that um, uh, th this kind of increased democracy that people feel that they, they want to get involved as councillors, that they have the opportunity, that they have the time um, we, we need to encourage younger people to stand for council. We need to encourage people who are employed and anything we can do to enable that to happen, I, I'm very much in favor of. Uh, and this tries to address that issue. The other thing I think is, is 
um, obviously I come into the administration and immediately have, have a, a degree of influence. Uh, I think it must be very different if you are on the other, the, 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 you're, you're not in that, that role, uh, and very frustrating. And I do think we need to be finding a way of using the skills and talents of people right the way across the council. I think that's something which, which we ought to be uh, enabling us to do. Again, that fits with this new model. So those are two positives for me. Um, various councillors have mentioned it's it, ultimately it's about it's about culture and that's men, mentioned in in paragraph five of this report it says um, culture behavior and attitudes tend to be more important than structure and I think that's uh, that's absolutely right it doesn't matter what structure we put in place if we put something in in there it can be abused and we just need to be careful the way we, we move it forward um, I'm, I'm delighted it's a cross party approach to to this uh, rather than just us coming in and saying well we'll make the changes I think to, to get all parties uh, coming forward with it and having Councillor Shaw and Councillor Paulson leading on this I'm, I'm delighted that uh, they've come up with this hybrid proposal which we can we can try to work for the future for the benefit of the whole county thank you thank you Councillor General leader and must be a very good position to be in and thank you for your work so far. Uh, Councillor Andrews. Thank you, Chairman. As one of the more uh, long-serving councillors, I have seen both the committee system and the cabinet system. Both systems have their advantages and their disadvantages. But uh, one of the advantages, it would seem to me, of this proposed hybrid system is that um, as backbench councillors may have a greater input than they do currently. So I'm happy to support it going forward. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Very concise. Councillor Lester, three minutes, yes, please. Chairman, thank you. I'm happy to support the motion and thank colleagues for all of their hard work on this. Um, I, I share Councillor Selden's view that um, I think the committee system is a, is a, a uh, going back into the past is very, uh, very good way of clogging up the system and being very inefficient. And I think in an era where we have to be uh, inventive and uh, do things differently, the last thing we want to be doing is going back into a system that will just frustrate things and dissuade people from getting involved. And I think now's the time that we can be inventive with uh, the proposals that are coming forward. But I do also uh, agree that it is a cultural uh, issue. And I, I understand the concerns of Councillor Summers. You know, we have to change the culture so that all of us, all um, members' views are taken into consideration and understood fully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lester. And I hope finally, Councillor Kenyon. Three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll, I'll make it fairly brief. I just wanted to point out, I, I do apologise. I haven't uh, sort of joined in with this debate and that sort of stuff before now. But um, we also want to be looking at the number of councillors. If you look at Westminster, there's 650 MPs and there's 66 million in the UK. And if you equate that down and do the sums, we're four times too many councillors for the amount of people we've got in, in Herefordshire, of 180,000. Um, by my sums, we should end up with 13 councillors. So if the if there were less councillors, I think decisions could be done better. I've been uh, an opposition councillor, both to the Conservatives and to the, the Coalition. Uh, I just seem to be sitting on the other side, miserable most of the time, and grumpy. But um, I'm not like that at all. I feel I can engage with Cabinet members. Um, people like to know who is making decisions. I mean, bonfire night, uh, John, uh, Councillor Harrington, I'm sure you'll be the most uh, burning effigy in Herefordshire. Bless him. Um, but people do like to know who are making these decisions. So that's that's very important too. Um, I'll leave it there, but um, I'm happy to see and support what's going to happen going forward. But let's not forget, uh, with a cabinet um, member or the, 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 the person in charge, people like to know who's in charge, who they can contact. Let's not lose that in the, the committee system. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cheerful, not Councillor Grumpy. And I think you have a good point that we need to know who's making the decisions, who, where the buck stops. It's always very important, important I think. I have no further speakers, uh, except that uh, Councillor Shaw, do you wish to respond to Councillor Harrington? Only very brief, uh, if I may, uh, if I may, Chair. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Only yeah, very briefly. Yeah, yeah. Um, really to say, in, in terms of contribution, uh, I very much appreciate that we do have a, a, a lot of new councillors uh, in the last uh, election. Um, you can contribute, um, you, you can call items into scrutiny um, and get them discussed, uh, issues which, which are coming before Cabinet. You can, if you're a member of Cabinet, you can ask scrutiny to look at an issue before you take a decision and, and I actually while I was in cabinet did do that once because scrutiny can give you a, a, a very much uh, a different uh, complexion on uh, the information you're receiving than, than you're getting necessarily from from officers uh, so those two points I, I, I'd like to to make uh, and the third one is speed of decision making we've seen during the COVID crisis you know um, a concern of mine is the number of the decisions that have been taken through general exception and, and urgency procedures. Well, you know, you can't do that if you if you're running through cabinet, uh, running through various committees. Um, so it's a, it is a dis speed of decision making in what is relatively a fairly small um, authority area. Uh, and I think the public expect us to, to, to make uh, decisions in a, a timely way. And, and even with the cabinet system, they they, they do tend to berate us for not making decisions very, very quickly. So that, that's all I wanted to, to, to add. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we now come to your seconder, uh, Councillor Bulderson, who has three minutes to sum up uh, particular views. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I really do welcome the debate and comments from the floor today. In the last 10 months, we have undertaken a great deal of activity to inform the recommendations that have been put before you today. Uh, the journey included understanding the principles of good governance, reviewing different governance models, assessing how decisions are currently made, and reviewing the current arrangements against the Ghana principles that were set by you at full council last October. The group then went on to identify areas where structure, cultural practice could be improved, and we assessed the pros and cons of these solutions and looked to other council operations to identify the preferred option. The working group didn't undertake these steps in isolation either. The group was guided by an independent body being the centre of governance and scrutiny, and we had a representative from each political group with cross-functional roles. We engaged members via workshops and a questionnaire, fed back our results to all members, and actively encouraged each working group member to consult within their groups to ensure all political opinions were adequately considered. We achieved full consensus within the working group with a unanimous agreement by the Audit and Governance Committee. Uh, as has been identified, not all members attended the workshops and only 67% of members responded to the questionnaire, which in itself highlights one of the key barriers to good governance that was identified, time. Members must juggle home life, work, council activities, new ways of working, plus other commitments, and not all members can contribute the same amount of time to council business. To ensure we maintain our most diverse member representation, we must take heed of this. This is not an interim position. The hybrid cabinet model provides members with the opportunity for involvement commensurate to their availability and interests. It does not require the council to embark on a formal legal process for governance change. And as outlined in section 13 of the report, a number of improvements have been identified that could address the raised concerns. I ask you to approve today's recommendation that a hybrid cabinet model of governance be adopted. This will then allow the working group to further consult with members on each of the concerns and improvements identified in the report and determine the resulting impact to the constitution. The effort required to undertake this work by our annual meeting in May should not be underestimated and I ask as many of you to participate as much as possible. It is expected that between now and May there will be a number of all member workshops to explore the practicalities of what a hybrid cabinet model of governance will look like at Herefordshire Council. The concerns raised today can be considered and the outcome will be a report to our annual full council in May with a revised constitution and an allowances scheme for your approval. A review will also be undertaken a year after implementation to determine whether the changes have produced the intended outcomes. So if you are still in two minds over this recommendation, your approval today does not close out the possibility of debate. It allows Herefordshire Council to move one step closer to a governance model that more strongly espouses all the key characteristics of good governance. Participatory, consensus orientated, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive, and follows the rule of law. I second this recommendation and I ask you to approve. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Bolson. I think this has been a, you've all done a very sterling task and I know you all work extremely hard and I think it is such an important thing for the council ongoing. And I hope that the 32% of members who didn't respond last time will be able to respond this time and everyone will have a chance to have their say and have their input and have, have themselves, I know they'll, they'll all be valued. All, all councillors responses will be very valued. So good luck in the future. And I will now uh, start moving to the vote. Please can democratic services display the proposed recommendation in the report, which is that having regard to the work undertaken by the Rethinking Governance Working Group and the recommendation of Audit and Governance Committee, a hybrid cabinet model of governance be approved with impl implementation from annual council in May 2021. The voting options for, against and abstain have been added to the electronic voting options. The options are now on screen. If you are unable to see the voting options, please access the poll icon at the bottom of your screen. Can Democratic Services confirm the voting number and that all members are available and ready to vote? Mr. Chairman, there are 50 eligible uh, members able to vote and they may start now. Thank you. Please can members vote for, against or abstain. Please cast your vote and ensure you press submit after selecting the option for which you are voting. And do remember to submit. Are all the votes in? Thank you. No members who did not vote. And the result of the ballot is 449 against one abstentions nil. Therefore, the recommendation is carried. I'm now going to call for a 10 minute break. So can you tell me to 48 to recommend a new capital budget? Sorry, I should have done this. Sorry, I'll start again because now we are being recorded. I do apologize. I, we were out of sync a bit. Herefordshire Leisure Pool Reopening, Agenda Item 8, pages 43 to 48, to recommend a new capital budget for the reopening of the Hereford Leisure Pool. The Cabinet Member Commissioning Procurement and Assets will move and introduce the report, which they have five minutes. Thank you, Chair. I hope not to take out all of the five minutes. I'm happy to be able to present this report that will allow the Herefordshire Leisure Pool to reopen. The report outlines the remedial works needed to ensure the building. Specifically, the repositioning of the pump room will ensure that it greatly minimises the likelihood of any flooding to take place in the future, therefore making it insurable. I am grateful to online forums for contributing to the debate on whether it should be reopened. And I'm especially grateful for all of the individuals who took the time to write me an email expressing their views. When faced with the cost of reopening the swimming pool, I asked myself two questions. One, is the current location of the pool sustainable in light of continual floods? Or two, does the pool need opening as soon as possible? In answering the first question, I concur with what most said in Cabinet in that it is not in the right location given the likelihood of future flooding. This is not about the premises specifically flooding, but about the availability of routes into and out of the centre, either by foot, bicycle or car, when we have the floods. Also, many of you will have seen that there's been little change to the centre since its opening. I think that it is in still the same slide that I used when I was younger. In answering the second question, swimming is a 0 to 99 and higher year old activity, encompassing all abilities. It has a significant impact on both the physical and mental well-being of our residents. I take my mother as an example of this. She suffers with severe arthritis and mental health issues. Swimming is one of the few exercises that she can participate in. Since the pool has been shut, she has been unable to participate in this activity and it has had a detrimental effect on both her physical and mental well-being. Furthermore, uh, I think we will all have seen that a recent UK study showed that some of the most deprived areas in the entire UK are within the south side of Hereford City. The 
it's really important that when we're looking at finances and whether or not we bring um, whether or not we pay for things to be repaired or have outgoings that are significant, that we don't just look at how much it's costing, but we also look at how much it brings in. So, for example, looking at that social value, if people are able to exercise under a certain in swimming baths where perhaps they've never taken part before in the most deprived areas, then what it will do is in future prevent a further expense in our health and social care system. I'm a proud Southsider um, of Hereford and I know my other Southwide councillors are very keen on us reopening the centre, but we, I've had to take in the two questions into consideration and I feel that it falls within that it's not the right location, but we have to do these remedial works in order for future plans for the leisure pool to come forward. Councillor Crockett and I have had a number of conversations about the leisure strategy for Herefordshire and a key part of this will be looking at where do we position the new pool within Hereford City. So taking all of the things into consideration, I feel that this is the right decision to make for the residents of Herefordshire. I was reminded by uh, Council, I think it was, Council, was it Councillor Lester, that it's not just people from within Hereford City who use our leisure pool, it's a Herefordshire residence. Um, centre and I completely concur with that. It's important that it reopens and I accept that there's a lot of money that is going to be required in order to do this but it's strategically it will take us too long to open up another site elsewhere in the, uh, elsewhere in the city so therefore I propose that we accept the recommendation to spend the money. Thank you very much Councillor Davis. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Harvey. You have three minutes, Councillor Harvey, or do you want to reserve your fire for later? Uh, I think I'll, um, I'll, I'll do a sum up at the end, if I may, Chairman. Yes, you may indeed. Thank you. Now, can members please indicate if they intend to speak? Councillor Kenyon. And then we have... Councillor Kenyon. Yes. Shall I start now, Chairman? Uh, just a moment, please. Can you just tell it to Shaw? No. Um, and Norman. Norman. Stark. 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 Summers. Thank you very much indeed. Andrews. Andrews. Right. Thank, thank you. Right. Councillor Kenyon, all yours. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I fully support the recommendation to reopen the pub at uh, the pub. The, that's something else on my mic. Absolutely. Keep the pub's open after 10 o'clock. No, the swimming pool. Um, I, my daughter is in a school um, and she went sw school swimming, is 32 in her class, so only 25 went swimming and that's I think mainly due to uh, they had to pay £25 to get a, hire a coach to go to Lebury, um, so it stopped children going uh, to a swimming pool, so I think that's, that's really sad really um, that they couldn't go swimming and I think that's one of the blocks to it. Um, the swimming pools looked a little sad for a, long, a lot of years. And um, when I go and off somewhere with my children, I take often take to Malvern Splash. This is not an advert for Malvern Splash, the swimming pool, but um, it's more to do with the facilities at the swimming pool. Um, I've mentioned this, uh, to the cabinet member about um, perhaps getting to spend a bit more on slides and making it a bit more interesting other than the, and the wave pool to encourage young young children to go along and engage with it. I'll, I'll hold it there. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people talking about things, but um, it, it's it's absolutely essential that we get this open back up. Let's not mess around. Let's not have another Fauno Road a year going on. Let's get it into it. Let's get it open. Let's get people coming from Fauno into the city and doing a bit of swimming. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a very good idea. Uh, Councillor Tillett. Thank you, Chair. Um, the leisure pool sits in my ward, so it would be surprising if I didn't support this proposal. Um, so I do, and I fully endorse everything that Councillor Davis said at the beginning uh, about its importance, particularly mm. for the South Y community. Um, I too have a family member who would have uh, benefited mm. from uh, post-stroke recovery had the swimming pool been open uh, during this period. Um, but because the pool is in my ward, um, I've had a wide range of emails from across the county making the very point that 
I understand perhaps uh, Councillor Lester made, that this is an all wards issue. It is a county facility. Um, and um, one of the groups of emails that have perhaps slightly surprised me um, have been those that have suggested in a way that our description of it as a leisure pool is a slight misnomer um, in the importance of it to um, competitive swimmers, both young and older competitive swimmers who represent the county um, or at club level, um, who have up till now relied on it as an important resource in their training. Um, so I just make the point that, you know, this is an all wards issue. It is a county facility um, and that for all types of users, both the leisure, leisure and the slightly more serious and competitive, uh, we do need to get this facility open and I warmly uh, support this proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Shaw. Councillor Shaw from the uh, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm very pleased to to support uh, investment to allow the reopening of of the Herefordshire Leisure Pool uh, and facilities before spring 2021. Uh, unfortunately, the citizens of Bromyard and surrounding area have received no such promise in respect of their leisure centre and library situated in my ward. With damage discovered after lockdown, the last communication that I received was three weeks ago when a contractor for external works has yet to be identified, electrical and surface finishes remain unspecified, and a time scale was yet to be determined. With these ongoing delays, perhaps the cabinet member might be prepared, prepared to wager on which facility might reopen first. Thank you. I'm not a betting man myself, but I understand your, your concerns. Uh, Councillor, uh, is it Councillor Norman? Yeah. Oh, Councillor Milne. Sorry. Uh, yes, Councilor thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, I, uh, I, I've also been uh, heavily lobbied by my constituents about the uh, about the state of the pool, um, urging us to to crack on and get it reopened as soon as possible, and and not least also by members of my family. My daughter benefited hugely when she when she was younger. She's now now nineteen and moved away. But uh, I um, and and indeed myself, I've enjoyed it. And of course, it's three pools, and it's not just a leisure pool. There's a competition and learning pool as well. And uh, okay, I migrated to 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 my swimming activities to to the to the through the River Wye until I learned of the pollution uh, um, occurrences there. So I I'm just inclined to use the Wye as an alternative. I'm much more uh, interested in using the, the the leisure pool. So while the sums look large, and yes, 169 thousand pounds on an electrical upgrade seems a lot of money, it uh, it w will produce a result that is as resilient to 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 the inevitable recurrences of flooding as it can be. Um, I, I fully support this, um, uh, uh, this, 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 the motion to, to, to spend this Thank money. You, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think also the uh, facilities for disabled swimming are also very important in the pool and that perhaps has not been um, understood by many as well. Uh, Councillor Norman. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, I, I, we're very lucky in Lempster where I live. We have a, our pool is open again. I believe you have to book, but we're very lucky. Wonderful pool there. But I absolutely, as everyone said, I'd like to do the same um, opportunities for people in Hereford. Completely agree with all the points that have been made. This is a form of exercise uh, and leisure that uh, everyone can enjoy, all ages, all abilities, and hugely beneficial in many instances. I did particularly want to make a point, though, about children actually learning to swim. This is not just about leisure, this is about possibly survival, long-term survival, and if children don't have the opportunity to learn how to swim, uh, then there are real dangers in their futures. So I, I guess their learning has been put on hold, most or many children during lockdown, but um, I think we have to ensure that all children have the opportunity to learn to swim, which they should be doing and would in normal circumstances be doing through their schools. So I really welcome this uh, being brought forward as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Norma. I do remember my first head teacher I worked for said, you can teach them all the reading, writing and arithmetic you like, 
And if they fall into a pond or a stream and they can't swim, well, your time has been completely wasted and those poor children's lives have been shortened all to, all to no avail. And so I think I agree, it is very important that children do learn to swim, let alone adults. Uh, Councillor Stark. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I fully support this proposal as well because the Hereford Swimming Pool is a key community facility and that it should be reinstated as quickly as possible. However, I would like to draw members' attention to the fact that Ross has two county-owned sports facilities that were also severely damaged in the flooding that occurred in February. In at least one of these cases, there is uninsured works that has to be carried out to bring the building back to a serviceable position. The costs that have been quoted are considerably less than in the case of the Hereford Swimming Pool. And if the council is minded to support this proposal, then I would expect equal treatment for the two sports facilities in my ward, both county owned, that were significantly affected by the flooding. Otherwise, members, I think my residents have every entitlement to say again that there's one rule for Hereford and another rule for Ross. Thank you very much, Chair. Th thank you, Councillor. Councillor Summers. I'm good, continue, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Andrews, Polly Andrews. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, like, like other city councillors, I've been inundated with requests to get the swimming pool uh, back functioning again. Just as a matter of historical uh, information, uh, the reason the pool was put there in the first place, and it is a difficult position for it to be in, was that um, the leisure centre in Homer Road was built first, and there were comp many complaints from the representatives south of the river at that time that the south of the river was being deprived of, of good facilities, so the swimming pool was placed there to, to um, support residents south of the river. Thank, thank you, Councillor Andrews. We have no cause of stone. Cause of stone. You seem to have disappeared. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you now. And Thank you very me. much. I fully support this proposal, Mr. Chairman. I think it's most important that the Hereford Leisure Pool opens, reopens as soon as possible um, while um, work continues about finding an alternative site. I got particularly personal reasons, Mr. Chairman, for supporting this. In that, when I was um, one of your as a predecessor of yours as chairman of the council, um, I took part in a sponsored swim at the Hereford Pool uh, with former councillor Sandy Robertson, um, raising money for Macmillan. So I have a particular reason for being keen on this pool reopening. Lemster really suffered when its swimming pool unfortunately had to close. And largely thanks to the activities of the local community and also to the administration of Councillor Roger Phillips. Um, there's a new pool in Lemster, which has been of tremendous value to the community. And it's helped, um, especially um, an area of, of Lemster that is in, in many ways quite deprived. So the social value is immense, as Councillor Davis said earlier. So, Mr. Chairman, I very much hope that the Hereford Pool will be open as soon as possible to the benefit of everybody in South Y and in Herefordshire generally. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor. I do remember you valiantly thrashing miles up and down that pool and raising <laughs> lots of money. So well done. Your, your, your efforts are not unremembered. Thank you, Mr. Great. Chairman, very much. And former Councillor Robertson's as well. Yes, I do remember. You were a great duo, weren't you? Um, much water passed under your, under your arms. Um, now, we have Councillor Phillips and then Councillor James. Um, yes, Chairman. Um, Councillor Stone has referred to the fact that we, we built a swimming pool um, in my time at, at Lemster, which was very much needed. Um, but what I wanted to make the point was that, you know, we know that rivers are very dangerous. Water is very dangerous. And those of us who have lived in Herefordshire all our lives will know that we have brought up with people who we know have been affected by deaths on the River Wye. The River Wye in particular is a very dangerous river. 
And so I very much applaud any administration of any political uh, device or whatever, that they have to consider the very much that the, we live with very dangerous uh, uh, rivers in, in, in our locality. And we must ensure that we have a proper strategy that addresses that basic concern. It's marvelous to have leisure and all the sort of health giving issues, but it's absolutely essential that we get people to learn to swim because of the dangers that we have got in our own county. Thank, thank you, Councillor Phillips. Uh, we now have Councillor James and followed by Councillor Hulls. Thank you, Chairman. Can I say I wholeheartedly support this particular proposal? I can't imagine anyone on the Council would not support this proposal, and especially the importance of, um, of swimming facilities, which are far more important than any other facility that we, leisure facility that we have, bearing in mind the need for young people to to be able to swim. I, I had three of my year in school who drowned in the River Wye before they were 20. Um, so, you know, th 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 there was at that particular period a large percentage of young people who didn't learn to swim. And I think it's important that every child does learn to swim. And the, commensurate with that, it is important that we have sufficient planning for uh, uh, swimming facilities throughout the, throughout the county. And it's important that uh, not only this facility is, uh, is up and running, but facilities in Ross and Bromyard are up and um, working. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Howells, followed by Councillor Silton. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I'm joining, obviously, in the sentiments of every speaker in supporting this, this recommendation. I'm lucky to live in Nembury, which has a recently refurbished pool, uh, which is now open again after lockdown. <coughs> As someone I'm, I'm pretty well known, I think, for health and safety and well-being, but key aspect of making the most of life. So I'm really very pleased to see this proposal coming up to complement the insurance money with money being spent to make sure the pool is open as soon as possible. Uh, even before COVID, I know from my own every experience that being able to access swimming facilities, and some of this has been mentioned already, is really a lifeline for many people, especially the older, which I'm one, of course, but I'm able to do most of the things, but many aren't. The disabled, I think you mentioned, Chairman, and people who've been injured who can't uh, partake in other forms of exercise. It's a sort of non-impact, but really useful cardiovascular sort of exercise, which makes swimming particularly valuable and allows people who can't take part in most other physical activities, but they can take part in swimming. And I think with um, the added detrimental impact on the lockdown, on mental well-being for many of those people for whom swimming is such a lifeline, it really is crucial, as everybody else has said as well, that we do keep the swimming facilities open and accessible as soon as possible and as um, Councillor Tilly said, it's a county-wide requirement as well, so as many facilities open across the county as possible is really important. Uh, I fully support the motion. Thank you, Councillor. We have now Councillor Seldon, Simons and Gandhi, and I think that will be the end of the debate. Councillor Thank you, Chairman. Seldon. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thinking from from your perspective, uh, Bromyard has been campaigning for a swimming pool for many, 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 many years. So, and I don't wish to belittle the, uh, the, the efforts to reopen the leisure pool in Hereford, but um, the children from Bromyard go to Tenbury Wells to learn how to swim. And that is now at the moment being subsidised by the uh, Bromyard Swimming Pool Trust. So hopefully, I hope all children in Bromyard primary schools get an opportunity to, to go to Tenbury to learn how to swim. To echo Councillor Stark and Councillor Shaw's words, it, it does, has to be an equitability about this, that um, the market towns where leisure facilities have been closed do need some information about what open again. And um, it's not just for, for, for the younger people, but the leisure facility in Bromyard and the gym is used by men, people of all age groups. So I think for their own well-being and for the well-being of the people generally, that it, we should be expediting the um, reopening of these uh, leisure facilities as far as finances allow. Um, I would also be interested to know what the timetable is for the reopening of the uh, um, payload facility in Bromyard is 
uh, going forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. And I'm sure information is always very good to have it out there in the public, isn't it? Uh, Councillor Simons, followed by Councillor Gandhi, and finally, Councillor Ginman. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, uh, I can speak from personal experience of having capsized a sculling boat on the River Wye in January a couple of years ago, that the lessons learned from childhood do genuinely save lives. Um, but that's not the point I was going to make. Um, I just wanted to speak in support of Councillor Stark's comments about um, uh, supporting this motion, but, the, but reiterating the need for similar investment in uh, the facilities in Ross and perhaps uh, urging the cabinet member to see if we can get some uh, commitment <coughs> to uh, prioritise um, that level inv of investment, which, uh, as Councillor Stark says, is significantly less than what uh, what, what is uh, being put before us today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Gandhi, and then Councillor Gentleman, finally. Thank you, Chairman. Um, speaking from experience, um, growing up at school, um, swimming for us was a luxury, um, and it was all outdoor um, in unheated pools. And as a result of that, for me, um, it put me off. And I didn't learn to swim until I was 68. I learned to swim at, at Lempster Swimming Pool. I went to the adult swimming classes there. Um, and I was thought I would be alone and that I was the only person in this part of Herefordshire who at my sort of age did not did not swim. Although I did at that time um, years ago own a boat um, and, and had no problems with it, but I had never learned to swim. Uh, it took me a time, but I now can swim. I love it. Um, and and I, I think people at any age um, should be encouraged to swim. So I think, you know, I don't think anybody can uh, miss the fact that swimming pools are extremely important, no matter what age you are. Thank you, Councillor Gandhi. I very much uh, feel sympathy with your views as too. Uh, Councillor Ginman. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, while speaking and very happy to support this uh, motion, it's important, it is south of the river, it's something which many from this part of the world will enjoy and use. Uh, it is an important facility for us all. I do want, however, to not miss this opportunity that Council should note paragraph six in the uh, key considerations uh, because of the nature of those few words that say uh, within that, this that the works were not covered by insurance due to the site investigations discovering legacy remedial works that require addressing. This in itself is obviously of some concern, and while not uh, as uh, councillors will be aware, I'm not very keen on blame culture at all, but I am on learning lessons. So the following lines that say we must use suitable qualified individuals to ensure that doesn't happen again seems to be vital. That is a lesson to be learned. I noticed Councillor Stark made the comment about Ross and White having uninsured uh, losses on that particular facility. This does raise a point in my mind as to whether or not there are other assets that belong to the council where indeed there might be concern as to whether there are potential for uninsured losses. Indeed, are there hidden or not yet revealed or not recently surveyed and found issues that relate to that? And I think it's important we learn the lesson from this, this event to ensure that there are not other things out there that we ought to be aware of. And indeed, where indeed these legacy um, events occur, it may be that there are individuals or companies that should be assisting in paying for that which they've clearly failed to do properly in the first place. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Gentleman. Now, Councillor Harvey, three minutes to sum up. Sorry, Councillor Bowen, um, you went back before to Councillor Shaw to um, just confirm a couple of things. It's just that there was a couple of questions that really do need answering with regards to Councillor Ginman's um, question then. 
Uh, yes, Councillor Davis, I will allow you this. OK, thank you. I just think it's important for the public domain to understand what's going on with our buildings. So historically, we have um, had a very reactive approach to our building. So when something goes wrong, we try and fix it. Inevitably, you will all know that when you do that, it costs a lot more. And quite often, there's a number of extra things, which is exactly what's happened in ross on Wye as well, as well as the Leisure Centre, um, Leisure Pool, sorry. Um, just to make you aware that we are now adopting a proactive approach to all of our buildings. So that will involve full condition surveys of our buildings that we currently own. So our assets that we currently own. And in the next year's budget, I hope that everybody that has discussed this on here will support the extra money that will be required to bring some of those buildings up to the right standard to prevent further expenses later on down the road. Um, I just want to give that assurance to Councillor Stark, uh, Councillor Simons, Councillor Shaw, and where's, where is he? He's gone, Councillor Selden, um, that it is a Herefordshire approach to a leisure strategy. It is not a Hereford approach to a leisure strategy. We've never had one before. We'll make sure that we are equitable across the whole of the county. And I promise to come back to you on all of your issues that you've raised today. Th thank you, Councillor Davis. And I think the Shire Hall will be top of your list as well, I'm sure. Uh, now, Councillor Harvey, it is your turn now to sum up. Three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, OK, well, I'll start off by picking straight up on the, uh, the points that were being clarified there by Councillor Davis. There are lessons to be learned here um, in terms of uh, um, making sure that we uh, properly fund investment in maintenance and that we make sure that we properly um, cover our assets from an insurance point of view. Um, there's also uh, lessons to be learned in terms of where we locate um, strategic uh, facilities for our communities to make sure that they are in sustainable locations and that they are going to be able to operate and be fit for purpose for years to come. It's a false economy to do otherwise. And when you cut um, parts of budgets which uh, are associated with the maintenance and the insurance of um, of your properties yes to begin with you don't notice that there's a problem um, and that's what's happened here but gradually over time the condition of the buildings deteriorates and sooner or later you actually have to deal with the consequences of what might have been seen as what might have more properly be seen as penny pinching in previous years um, We've all <clears throat> been on the receiving end of austerity. We've got difficult times now and more difficult times yet to come. It's going to be a really difficult balance as we go through the budget process in the autumn, making sure that we can um, get the, uh, the, the, sp the spending and the funding right across our services. And I'd like all councillors present to be bearing that in mind and to engage actively in the budgeting consultation processes that come and encourage their communities to do likewise. Um, highlighting paragraphs 22 to 24 in terms of minimising the risk associated with this. Um, we don't want to have repeat damage to the pump room and the way that the repairs are going to be undertaken will hopefully make sure that if the site does suffer further flooding incidents, which are quite likely as a consequence of climate change, um, that uh, the, um, the equipment itself will not be damaged. However, the site will continue to be inaccessible during periods of flooding simply because the car park and the, the access routes in um, are impaired when, uh, when flooding takes place. That's why I am really keen that as part of doing this work, we absolutely put plans in place as part of the update of our core strategy to be planning for investment in a new um, swimming pool and, and leisure facility for the city at a sustainable location. Um, and in agreeing to this uh, investment being made to bring the pool back online, I think we absolutely have to properly plan for the future. And I'll be looking for support uh, in the same measure as you have for this investment, for there to be support for that kind of a strategic investment in the future. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey. Now that brings us to the vote. Please can Democratic Services display the proposed recommendation in the report. And as this is a vote on a budget matter, the solicitor 
solicitor to the council will conduct a recorded vote. I should call out the names of all members present and request that they clearly state whether they are for or against or abstaining from voting. I'm just going to read out the recommendation first. To approve the addition of a new capital budget to fund uninsured regulatory and essential works required at Hereford Ledger Pool. To be funded by existing budgets wherever possible and otherwise from... Oh, sorry, I've taken away my script a bit. Um, other, can we have the recommendation, please? Is it? Uh, sorry about that. I must give you this proper recommendation. Thank you. The fourth recommendation, to, yes, I'll read it to start again. To approve the addition of a new capital budget to fund uninsured regulatory and essential works required at Hereford Leisure Pool to be funded by existing budgets wherever possible, and failing that, new prudential borrowing not expected to exceed 505,000 pounds. So, moving to the vote. I should call out the names of all members present and request that they clearly state whether they are for or against or abstaining from voting. Councillor An Graham Andrews. For. Councillor Paul Andrews. E. Councillor Polly Andrews. For. Councillor Bartlett. For. Councillor Bartram. For. Councillor Balderson. Councillor Balderson. For. Can you hear me? For. Councillor Bolter. For. Councillor Bowen. For. Councillor Bowes. For. Councillor Chowns. For. Councillor Crockett. For. Councillor Davis. For. Councillor Fagan. For. Councillor Foxton. For. Councillor Gandhi. For. Councillor Guthrie. For. Councillor Hardwick. For. Councillor Harrington. For. Councillor Harvey. Oh. Councillor Hewitt. Oh. Councillor Hay. Oh. Councillor Hitchener. Oh. Councillor Howells. Oh. Councillor Ianson. Oh. Councillor James. Oh. Councillor Jinman. Oh. Councillor Johnson. Oh. Councillor Graham Jones. Four. Councillor Mike Jones. Four. Councillor Kenyon. Four. Councillor Lester. Four. Councillor Marsh. Four. Councillor Milmore. Four. Councillor Mill. Four. Councillor Norman. Four. Councillor Phillips. Four. Councillor Price. Councillor Price. Councillor Roan. Four. Councillor Selden. I'm sorry, I got uh, kicked out of the room, so I didn't hear the whole debate. So I okay. would. Councillor Shaw. Four. Councillor Stark. Four. <coughs> Councillor Stone. Four. Councillor Summers. Four. Councillor Swinglehurst. Four. Councillor Simons. Four. Councillor Tillett. Four. Councillor Toynbee. Four. Councillor Tyler. Sorry, I've had technical difficulties, so I have to abstain. Councillor Watson. Four. Councillor Wilding. Four. <laughs> Councillor Price, were you there for the whole debate? Yes. Where are we? Have, have you voted? You haven't voted yet. What is your vote? 
Are you for, against, or abstaining? You, you, you're switched off. You're a, a mute. Ah, now you can talk. Oh. Four. Thank you. Good. Thank you. The result is 48 for and two abstentions. So that, that recommendation is, is passed, and we shall then move on to the next matter. Thank you very much for your uh, good, good influence on the, on the whole debate. Thank you all. Uh, item 9, 2019-20, Treasury Management Outturn, pages 49 to 60, to approve the Treasury Management Outturn for 2019 to 20. The Cabinet Member of Finance and Corporate Services will move and introduce the report, and you have five minutes to do so. Chairman, um, I've got pleasure in uh, presenting this report to full council with the recommendation that the Treasury Management Outturn, as detailed at Appendix 1, be approved. Um, hopefully members have had an opportunity to, uh, to review the report. Um, I'd, I'd particularly like to highlight um, at the outset and give um, uh, a public record to um, uh, our officers, Karen Jones and Josie Rushgrove and the, the teams that they lead, who do a fantastic job on behalf of the council every day, all year round, making sure that the um, cash reserves and the uh, money we have on deposit is getting the very best rates of interest return that they that they can and year in year out um, treasury management somehow or other manages to deliver um, uh, an underspend um, in order to support other areas of the council um, in this particular financial year which is uh, this report goes through to march 2020 um, we are, um, the, some of the underspend uh, as outlined in paragraph four is associated with underspend in capital investment. Um, and I'd also like to highlight that um, there has been uh, higher investment balances and higher interest returns that have contributed to the um, net um, underspend uh, of about 700,000 pounds. Um, looking at the detail in Appendix 1, um, I'd like to draw uh, members' attention to uh, paragraph 3.6, where you can see that um, over the 12 months in question, uh, we actually had um, a reduction in our total borrowing of just over 7 million. Um, a reduction in our long-term liabilities of uh, just under 3 million um, and a reduction therefore in our overall total external debt of just shy of 10 million pounds. Um, associated with that was that the council continued to use its own internal cash reserves to minimise the requirement for borrowing wherever possible and in 1920, the council used just over £134 million pounds of um, its own uh, cash reserves to fund projects which would otherwise have required borrowing. Um, Treasury management is, um, is not everybody's cup of tea. It, it's quite complicated. It's quite detailed. We've got some very clear principles that are followed by our officers. Um, that ensure that the way that we invest our money uh, and the, the money that belongs to the people of Herefordshire um, is done in as safe uh, a way as possible. And uh, as a council, we are recognised as having taken quite a risk averse approach to um, any of the investments that, that we have made. So they are solid and sound. And um, I think it's a tribute to the work of the teams involved that um, we continue to be in the healthy financial position that we are as far as our treasury management performance is concerned. And um, I commend the report to council. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Harvey. Uh, have you got a seconder? Yes, I, I would like to second uh, the motion, but uh, leave my reply to the end of the debate, please, Chair. That is fine. 
Now, do we have anyone who wishes to speak <coughs> on this matter? I don't see any hands up yet. Ah, Councillor Shaw, and you may commence. Councillor Shaw, all yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I, I too would like to thank uh, our Treasury Management Officers uh, for their work in, uh, in maximising the use of our reserves and deposits uh, uh, during the year and in producing such a, uh, to me, of such a readable report. I note, uh, as uh, did the Cabinet member, the con key consideration in paragraph four, page 50, that the main reason for the underspend being because there was no external borrowing following a significant underspend in capital investment in 2019-20, the first financial year of the new administration. I'm pleased to say in the last 12 months, uh, salaries nationally have increased by 4.3%, in Shropshire by 3.5%, in Worcestershire by 6.4%, and in Gloucestershire by 7.5%. However, in Herefordshire, we've bucked the trend. Here, they have actually decreased by 1.1%. Would the leader now concede the truth in the ancient Chinese saying, to get rich, build roads first? And will he now accept his administration's habit of causing delay and making U-turns has begun to damage our local economy? Thank you, Councillor Shaw. Um, and I think it is very good that our officers are being properly recognised for the great job they've done. Uh, do we have another speaker? Councillor Kenyon, off you go. Thank you, Chair. I've been chops in quite a lot today. Um, you have. There's, there's no, well... You've got three minutes to chops. Thank you. There may be a daft question. This might be one, but it might be, be genius. Um, there's this very thin line between it. Um, obviously, we run businesses and the, the council is a big business. Um, I do know that um, the government are giving um, COVID business recovery loans at very, very preferable rates. Are we eligible? And have we looked into whether we could reduce some of our debt by borrowing? That's my question. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Kenyon. I'm sure you'll be answered later on. We have Councillor Marsh. Thank you. Yes, I do want to say um, thank you to the officers who produced this report because, um, yes, I'm certainly not an expert and I did just about manage to hang on and understand it. So I hope that will also be good for other members of the public who are also wanting to understand how the council works. Um, I'm very encouraged by the um, level of soundness, the fact that the indicator is going the right direction, partly because I'm very aware, <coughs> as Councillor Harvey mentioned earlier, that the um, working out the budget for the coming year will be extremely difficult with the um, many challenges we face. So uh, basically, this is a thank you to those who have helped put us in a, a good position and uh, wish that we will all do our very best to be both constructive and creative as we move towards our um, budget for next year. Thank you, Councillor Marsh. I believe it's Councillor Howells next. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, I'm uh, the Council Delegate to the very important Lower Seven Internal Drainage Board, which actually is far more interesting and um, pertinent than I thought it might be. Uh, Every year they ask you to which committees you want to attend and not being particularly conversant with treasury management, as Councillor Harvey says, it's not the subject most people find particularly fascinating. I decided that would be a good committee to take part of. Uh, and it's been really interesting learning curve, not least, and the point I wanted to make was being quite active in helping to simplify the report so they're better understood for people who aren't conversant with treasury management wording and techniques uh, and so to be able to read this report that really was understandable and easy reading somebody else has already mentioned was very reassuring having gone through that learning curve I've gone through so I'm very happy to support the recommendation that we accept it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor James. Thank you Chairman. I, I uh, echo the, uh, the statements that have been made by virtually every member so far in this this debate, I have to say, uh, you know, we're, we're in a more comfortable position, perhaps this authority, and this is goes back a number of years, than many authorities throughout the country. Um, I do think there is an issue, and, and uh, Councillor Shaw, I think, mentioned it, the fact that the 
level of, of um, salaries and, and uh, income in this county is way, way below. And we have a problem coming up, I think, that many people from the richer and uh, more affluent parts of the, count, of the country are wishing to relocate to this, this county and will create problems for housing, I think, in the long term. But that's an, a, another issue to a certain extent. But it is reflected in the fact that the local people are the local people are receiving much lower income rises than the rest of the country as a whole. Thank you, Chair. I support the recommendation. Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Do we have any more speakers? Councillor Wilding. Off you go. Three minutes. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to bring members' uh, attention to another ancient Chinese proverb, which is, if you want to get rich in natural capital, build cycle paths. Is that it? Thank you. Yes, thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Wilding. Uh, and I see no more speakers indicating. So we'll go to Councillor Hitchner, leader of the council, to sum up this little piece. Yes, well, I think I think uh, everybody commends the uh, officers for doing a great job with this. So I have no problem whatsoever in seconding uh, this motion. Um, I would take uh, issue with a number of things that Councillor Shaw has, has said. Um, first of all, the, the, the concern about growth in the county, he's absolutely right. It is a major concern. For 10 years, 10 years, this county has been growing slower than the rest of the, the rest of the country. It's not a problem from last year. This is a problem which has been going, going on for ages and collectively we need to be doing something about that. So it's not about this new administration and what we're doing. We have inherited this problem. We've inherited the phosphates issue problem which should have been tackled a long time ago. Earlier in the, uh, this morning, we were talking about housing. The number of houses which were built 20 years ago is twice what they've been built. We've actually built more this year, delivered more this year, than has taken place for some time. So it's not about this administration, it's a longer term issue, which we need to be working on together. Building a, a road, uh, is that suddenly going to give wealth? No, it's going to take at least 10 years to do that and cost us an absolute fortune. Uh, we, have, we have not performed a U-turn. Uh, we are doing things differently. We are looking at climate change. I have no apology whatsoever to make for us reviewing and looking at this again in the in the context of climate change um so uh, so those, those are those are my comments but i would still commend uh, this paper to you thank you uh thank you very much uh leader uh, well moving to the vote please can democratic services display the proposed recommendation in the report and I'll read it out to you. Uh, and the recommendation is that the Treasury management outturn for 2019-2020, as detailed in Appendix 1, be approved. And the voting options are for, against, and abstain. And they have been added to the electronic voting options. The options are now on the screen. If you are unable to see the voting options, please access the poll icon at the bottom of your screen. Can Democratic Services confirm the voting number and that all members are available and ready to vote? Chairman, there are 49 members eligible to vote and they may vote now. And please remember, once you've voted for, against or abstain, press the submit button. Are all the votes in? Yes, all the voters. Thank you. And the results are four, 48, against, zero, abstentions, one. Therefore, the recommendation is carried. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I now have to ask you if you're prepared to uh, set aside standing orders and carry on for the rest of the meeting without pause. Do we put hands up? Do we just carry on? No, carry, on, carry on, Chairman. Carry on, Chairman. Carry on. We will carry on then, in true Whitehall style, Whitehall fast style, probably. We now come to agenda item 10, Leader's Report, pages 61 to 86. Always a highlight of these meetings. 
to receive a report from the leader on the activities of the executive, the cabinet, since the meeting of council on the 17th of July, 2020. Members are reminded that they may ask questions upon this report, but there will be no debate on matters contained in it. Questions should be concise and to the point, and please try to avoid repeating points already covered. That is important. I invite the leader to present the report and to respond to any questions arising. Uh, so, thank you, Chairman. Um, my, my report has been tabled. Um, uh, this time I'd just like to make a few introductory comments. Um, these are exceptionally difficult times that we live in. Um, focus is clearly on, on COVID and the potential negative effect that's having on the council and council finances. So I just want to place that in context that uh, there are all sorts of issues uh, and concerns around uh, with the economy, uh, with employment, um, the furlough scheme coming to end could have a, a dramatic effect on employment in our county. Uh, young people seeking employment, young people going to university and colleges, mental health, the effect on, on businesses, people who've been running businesses, building them up for many years are, are, are under threat. Uh, tourism, culture, I mean, wherever you turn, there are, there are problems. And I don't by any means want to underplay that, that that's the situation which we are in. Um, but there are good things happening. So I just want to try to balance that a, a, a little bit. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I've been involved in a number of uh, activities um, and contacts, which, which uh, to my mind are, are tremendously positive uh, and that we can look forward to. So first of all, the Stronger Towns Board, um, that's working tremendously well. It's, it's not a council body. It's, it's uh, something set up by the government deliberately with very small council uh, representation on it. So it's looking at what the community wants, what the town wants. And the public engagement is, I think, going very well. We've appointed some consultants um, who, who happen to be from Lincoln. And I think that's, uh, that's a nice coincidence for us because Lincoln um, have a university. Um, they, they buy into the social value uh, concepts and um, um, the, the, the consultancy are, are working for three or four other towns on this project. And of course, they, they have a football club, um, uh, a little bit more successful than ours at the moment. Um, but uh, it, it, there are very positive and very good links. And there's also potential links we have with them over providing some services to them through our, our Hoople company. There's very positive news on Maylords. I uh, had a meeting, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, the centre manager there, and he said there is a buzz about the place. There is an excitement. And I do take um, Councillor Matthew's uh, question about the levels of rent. But if, if you end up charging rents, which are the full market rent, we'll end up with an empty centre. So we have to be flexible. Um, and you will have more information about that later. There is a new, new uh, premises that have been opened. I think it looks very professional, very upmarket, very good for us called making it make it happen. It's arts and craft orientated. It hopefully will include, include in, in, encourage footfall, uh, a local entrepreneur, new business. And I'm tremendously excited about that. I'm also really pleased with councillor cross-party engagement that we have at the moment. We've run a couple of courses. Uh, seminars on, on phos the phosphate problem, um, nutrient management, attended by over half of councillors uh, and also some councillors from Powys, uh, people from the Environment Agency, just some very good engagement. We had another one the other day about the planning white paper, lots of engagement by councillors and I think that was, that was tremendous. And in my own ward, there are people uh, on the parish councillors who are, who are wanting to participate and contribute towards the debate on planning. Other engagement is, is with Hereford City Council. We've got regular meetings with them, trying to work to make sure that we have a joint, joint vision. Um, working with Enmite as well. Perhaps we haven't stepped up to the plate quite as well as we might with the market towns from what, uh, what I'm hearing at this meeting. But that's an area where we're going to continue to, to uh, uh, communicate uh, and understand and, and Im improve how things work. The shelf store is being opened officially next week. That's another very exciting project. Um, I'm looking forward to, to going down there. And just finally, at a national level, we are being noticed. 
um, for our response to COVID. And I think we should uh, applaud the response that's been provided by the community, by the officers, uh, by the chief executive, by Public Health England, by Karen Wright, um, to, to, to this crisis. We've had Matt Hancock, Dido Harding and Robert Jenerick all putting Hereford up as a bit of an example. We don't want to be shot down for, for doing that, but we are obviously doing something right. And, and there is no problem, as far as I'm concerned, in our being a little bit in the, in the national picture for that. Part of it, it creates a problem for us because it makes us more attractive. Um, people want to come to live here, the point that Councillor Shaw was making, um, but we don't have enough houses. So we've got to unlock the River Wye, uh, the, the lug issue. So, you know, things, things are all inter intertwined, but there are some really positive signs in, in a situation where, as I've said, it, it, is, it is going to be very difficult uh, as we move forward. So just with that background, I'm now, uh, hopefully I'll do my best to answer any questions you have on my report. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. First of all, the question is Councillor Gandhi, followed by Councillor Lester. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, and thank you, Leader, and thank you for a very comprehensive report. And I think we all recognise the difficult times that um, you've inherited as an administration, um, something that I um, don't think any of us would have recognised um, 12 months ago was likely to happen. Um, my question is to do with, with Maylord. Um, in your July um, report, you, when you first had acquired Maylord, you, um, at that full council meeting, put, um, it wasn't a plea, but a request out to local residents, businesses, etc., to come forward with ideas as to how they felt the Maylord Centre should be um, shaped going forward. Um, and I'd like to know how many actually came forward with ideas and if you could give us some idea of the flavour of the sort of ideas that came forward that you might be contemplating. Thank you. Yeah, um, I don't leader. have, yeah, Councillor, I don't, I don't have the precise information for that. I'll ask um, Councillor Davis in a moment whether she has more information. Um, I have tried to direct um, uh, groups who I think might be interested towards towards Maylords and using this asset for our benefit. Uh, I've had another contact from a, a local business um, where they felt that their ability to manage their particular shop was restricted by um, um, by the previous owners, uh, and we're, we were able to to help them out a little bit. Um, the the, uh, the social engagement is something which we're trying to work very hard on. And I know there's one property where Councillor Davis is working to, to uh, uh, open it up to the wider community. Councillor Davis, are you able to give a little bit more information on that, please? Yes, happy to. I can't give you the exact figures, only because it's, we, I've been in some um, talks uh, put on around community uh, social value where there's been about 40, 50 people in there. So they've all been part of that conversation. Had a really good response, and the general the general things that people are saying is firstly that they want it to be cleaned up the whole area, so it looks untidy at the moment. How do we make it look better? And specifically targeting the Brewers Passage area within there, um, so it's, it's it is quite daunting. And certainly, if you're walking through there at night, it's not safe to walk through there. You can't see at the end of the alleyway, for example. So that really easy fixes people have been coming up with so I've been really grateful for people offering to provide services to clean it up to provide um, planters to put in place to make it more presentable the general consensus around people that are wanting to short term for Maylords is let's create a buzz about it and let's create a buzz based around experiences so let's get people coming to Hereford Centre, but staying in Hereford Centre and using a number of different pools in order to do that. So we've had a really, really good response from the cultural sector saying we want we want to have um, different types of performances out in Trinity Square. Um, we're going to put on creative working workshops for younger people. So things such as that that will grab people into the city centre that would have ordinarily bought online and then they can use our shops at the same time. So that's that's what's come through. Um, for me, what's been really exciting is about the connect that I've had, sorry, connect I've had around health and well-being. Sorry? 
Can you bring it to a close, please? Yeah, of course I am. Um, is you. around uh, health and well-being and the connect between health and well-being. So long term, how do we turn Maylords into something where you have culture, you have um, retail, you have experiences and you have health and well-being driven at the centre of it? So I think that's probably a really exciting development that Councillor Crockett and I are working on around the Talk Communities agenda. Thank you, Councillor Davis. We now have Councillor Lester, followed by Councillor Phillips and then... Vice-Chairwoman Guthrie. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank the Leader of the Council for being positive. Um, and uh, I note some of the positive things in the report that he's uh, covered, um, because there are some very difficult challenges that the Council's dealing with, and uh, it is always important to talk up the positives as and when they arise. Um, my question, is, I refer to paragraph 28, of the leader's report, uh, and then also the letter from the council solicitor we received yesterday, defending the council's position not to repay the monies uh, already spent on the Southern Link Road project. We were told by the administration that they lost the funding because there wasn't time to re-procure for the building of the road. Uh, Councillor Shaw was told in May that the timescales for road procurement were too short. Now we're being told uh, that, that the defence of the council in not paying back the money is that there is plenty of time to deliver on the objectives of the project. Another 20, uh, 39 months, in fact. So therefore, can I ask the leader of the council, which is it? Leader, well, uh, uh, which is it? approach is, is, is on all fronts, uh, as you can understand. Um, Councillor Lester, None of us wants to be repaying this money to the council, so uh, to uh, to Shropshire. So uh, uh, we we will um, put our case, our best foot forward, uh, in all in all possible ways. Um, so I don't think it would be right for us as a council just to put all, all our eggs in one basket. And I hope you would you would support us in that because it's for the benefit of of the whole uh, county that we defend, uh, and we don't have to make this repayment. I think Councillor Harrington might want to add to that. Councillor yes, Harrington, indeed. do you wish to add a, a few words? I, I do, if possible. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Chairman. Th thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Lester. I think, I think the point that the legal team are making is that uh, the outcomes were identified as creating jobs and houses over a, a certain period, and that period hasn't expired. How it's done is up for interpretation. We certainly could not have, we, we certainly could not have proceeded, even if we wanted to, uh, with the procurement issue, because we would not have had time to have re-procured in the time that was left, and that is unfortunate. But I, I certainly won't use that excuse. and Don't want you. No, no, that, that is a, that is a fact as far as I'm concerned. We can debate it. You, you kept it a secret for months. You, you didn't put it in the public domain. You should have cancelled that. You should have cancelled the procurement the minute you knew there was a failure with it, and you should have re-procured, and you didn't. That was a major failing. No, no. Regardless of that, we had the opportunity then to review. We've taken that opportunity. Uh, you, you you used pothole money to pay consultants. You did all sorts of bizarre and unexplainable things that we are working through in our review. Um, but in, in relation to that particular question, uh, the outcomes will be achieved. They may be achieved in a different way. That is the answer. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Phillips. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, Leader, I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the, the phosphate issue, which of course is completely sterilized my, uh, my ward and bit development in my ward at the moment. Um, I welcome the, the money from the, uh, uh, the homes bonus and also the million pound from the LEP to recognize the timescale of expenditure on that and the work that's been done. I'm sure listening in like, uh, like I did, you noted in particular the comments of uh, Natural Resources Wales, who indicated that the Welsh upper catchment area of the Wye was on the brink also of going into lockdown um, uh, and, and a moratorium on development, but of course was going off to the Welsh uh, Assembly just to see, and the Welsh Government, and so we will watch with interest what impact that has. My particular issue it very much is that I've been working with officers, particularly on a wetland project and the sewerage works in my uh, ward, but also in particular is to bring the agricultural community, which of course the land has got this phosphate locked in it for the next 50, 60 years, whatever we do, and to try and prevent the runoff of soil into our river courses and our, our water courses. And in particular, I think we do need to work very closely with DEFRA that in sensitive zones like ours, 
But now that we have the knowledge, we have the capacity to identify those fields that are most significant uh, to actually run off into the river and deposit the soil and the phosphate, that we actually work with DEFRA on a scheme that actually returns those fields to grassland, to sustainable grassland is where that will be far more stable or that they have far wider margins in the future. And that is something I think that is very positive it's very difficult. It's easy for uh, to get an investment in a sewerage works to do to do something with regard to phosphate levels. But on that agricultural land, it's going to be difficult because it's so locked in there. But we've got to do something like that. And I think by working with other areas in the country also that are similarly affected, we need to put pressure on DEFRA now as those environmental rules are coming and being matured and get them in as an incentive to stop that soil going in to our water courses. Thank you, Councillor Phillips. Yes, thank you, Councillor I'm, I'm not quite sure that was a question, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy to comment on that. I think this is, a, this is an issue for the whole county, isn't it? Um, uh, that we need to be working together. And I, I'm very, very conscious that, that the farming community needs to be working with us. Uh, and they mustn't be seen as, you know, that we're not here to bash farmers. We, we want to be working with them to come up with a solution. So you mentioned DEFRA, but it's not just DEFRA, it's, it's the farmers we need to be working with who, who are, uh, uh, you know, I, I see the problem in the lug, uh, not being able to build houses. Well, uh, that's going to become an economic issue, which is going to affect farmers because farmers rely upon new buildings on, on development and that kind of thing. So it's not just a, a, an environmental issue. It's, it's also an economic issue issue. So we need to be working really with, with farmers. Um, I, the, the one thing actually that struck me at that meeting was that, that on the Welsh side, because, because the, the lug is such a valued e environmental site, it has very high, much more stringent standards. So the water that's coming in from Wales may be okay for Wales, but they put it into the, the beginning of our county already at too high a level. So we do need to be working with, with Paris. Uh, we need to be uh, working with with DEFRA, um, and and thank you for your your support because it is it is such a significant issue that it affects us all. And and I commend Councillor Swinglehurst for all her, her work on it as well. And Councillor Harrington, I wonder whether you'd just like to to comment because we yes, you know how how do we work with DEFRA how, um, and how do we then persuade the farmers that and, and also working with uh, with uh, Avara. Uh, that th they're such an important employer in the county. The, the wealth that comes through the county through farming is so important. We need to be working together and also to, to preserve the rivers at the same time. Councillor Harrington. No, I agree entirely with Councillor Phillips. I mean, you know, he may be on the other side, but he's very often got very good points and he's got a lot of knowledge. And, and he's exactly right. Uh, we need to be working with DEFRA. Uh, and we, because of the efforts of councillors like himself, Councillor Swinglehurst, this council and our officers have worked extremely hard. We have Powers County Council now taking this extremely serious. We have Natural Resources Wales now taking this extremely seriously. They're going, doing a huge amount of monitoring and testing that they hadn't done, let's say, before because of resource or they had changed their methodology. And, and I think the pressure that everyone has put on, but particularly Herefordshire Council uh, and our MPs, has been exceptionally helpful. Uh, and I think we have a solution. And I think... The point that, that Councillor Phillips is making is a very valid one in terms of land management. You know, it's very easy to apportion blame to certain people, to certain sectors, whether that's sewerage discharge or whether that's farmers. And the point he makes about being farmers being less able to react in a way that sewerage works is, is, is exactly right. They need the support. Uh, they need to be encouraged to, uh, you know, to, 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 to uh, plant the right crops, crops that are certainly valuable, but crops that have value beyond being chucked into a biodigester so that we're getting corn grown on pasture land on an, on an incline um, because that is the way that we are, that, that is the way the world is at the moment. So it's, it's, it's uh, entirely possible for us to, to, to do this and I, I welcome the support of, of uh, councillors like uh, Councillor Phillips. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Harrington. I think we all have interest in these matters. Uh, now, Councillor Vice Chairwoman Guthrie, please. And the thank question, you, what is the question? Yes, thank you, Chairman. And uh, thank you, Leader, for your report. My question is regarding the update on the Shire Hall. I think it's probably possibly around three times the Shire Hall 
has had an issue with collapsed ceilings. Is there a, a time scale as to when the surveys, the structural alterations and improvements are going to be completed by? And when the works have been completed, can members be assured there will be no further collapses in the future at a time when possibly we return to uh, council meetings at the Shire Hall? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Guthrie. Uh, Leader. Yes, well, this goes a little bit to the uh, to the issue with the swimming pool, I think, uh, long term maintenance issues and uh, central government reducing our, our budgets over the years um, uh, and not being able to maintain properties and, and being reactive. Um, I, I, the, the figures I've heard are a bit eye watering. This is a this is a, um, a, a building which requires particular care in the way it's going to be uh, um, um, refurbished. Um, we have some issues with the, the uh, town hall as well. Um, it's all a matter of priorities at the end of the day, where we're going to be spending the money. I would hate to, to provide you with a, with a date and then find that, that it's, not, uh, it's not achievable. Um, Councillor Davis, do you have any more recent information on, on, on uh, when, when we might be at least getting a full survey done of this, this property? Councillor yeah. Davis. Yeah, um, keep it brief. The there were more. We previously we did just a basic condition survey, and the basic condition survey wouldn't have shown the damage that was happening underneath. It, there's a suspended ceiling and a suspended ceiling underneath that. Um, what a normal condition survey it wouldn't have picked up on that fact. Whereas a full condition survey, which is what we should have done in the first place, would have picked up on those factors. So that full condition survey is well underway. But alongside that, I've asked them to look at the entire building and the maintenance of it to ensure that everything is up to standard. And again, this is that was the hint that I gave earlier, that there will be things coming forward where we're saying that an awful lot of money will have to be spent on some of our uh, some of our assets in order for them to, in the future, not cost us more money. Um, so I think I, I've got a plan that I'm more than happy to share with councillors. It hasn't got a timeline on it, um, but I'm more than happy to send that out and ask um, property services to send out a full update to all councillors on it. But with all the will in the world, we're going to try and future proof the building so that something like this never happens as much, well, hopefully never happens to the same extent that it has um, again. Thank you, Councillor Davis. And I think sending out that report and any follow-ups will be very useful indeed to us all. Thank you. It's, certainly it's, a, it's a subject that's been exercising me quite considerably. Uh, Councillor Fagan, please. And then followed by Councillor Watson. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank the leader for the report and particularly for the work that has been done on behalf of young people in the county um, for, for calling up the peer on um, peer ab ab abuse situation and investigating that further. Um, as a corporate parent, I was really pleased to hear about the accommodation based support for care leavers and corporate parenting and care leaver strategy, which will improve outcomes for young people and supporting them to live independently, manage their lives safely and confidently. Um, we must give our young care leavers every opportunity to thrive in these troubling times. One of the things that concerned me as a corporate parent was, was hearing how um, the young people had lost their facilities during COVID and um, that there had not really been any consultation on that. And I just wonder if the leader could actually sort of assure me that uh, young people who are sort of we as corporate parents are responsible for will be consulted about uh, new premises and uh, going forward. Yes, thank you, Councillor Fagan. Um, I think we're, we're planning to um, try to cover that off by ensuring that every decision we make actually has uh, reflects um, our core, corporate parent uh, obligations, uh, which are, are so important. Um, so that, that's hopefully a way of, uh, of making sure these uh, things don't happen again. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. <coughs> Question from Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, actually, mine is just um, feedback. Um, 
My residents and uh, parish councillors in my ward uh, want to express their thanks for your monthly reports, uh, which I share with my report. Um, and I understand that they, uh, these reports weren't in place before I was elected. Um, the reports enable members of the public to understand and read what the cabinet members are working on. And um, it, that's really just a, a feedback that I've been asked to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shaw, have you a question, please? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I thank the Leader uh, of Council for his report. Um, and I note the Leader refers to the acquisition of Maylord Orchard Shopping Centre in paragraphs 18 to 20 on page 64. With less than two thirds of the rent due so far collected for the first quarter in July and substantial service charges unpaid, can he advise the ratepayers of Herefordshire how much this bargain basement buy is going to lose them this year? Similar shopping centres are seeing capital write-downs in value for all this impairment. Is any anticipated for Maylord? Leader? Uh, I can certainly deal with the, uh, the last um, uh, point. Um, the property was, was acquired at a, at a price which was below valuation. And that valuation took into account the market conditions and deteriorating conditions at the time. Um, so I, I'm, I'm as confident as I can be that, uh, uh, that there will not be a need for a write down. Of course, um, I suppose I'm a political leader rather than an expert on this. So, so when Grant Thornton come and uh, do their audit, they, they're not going to take my word for it. Um, there will be a need, I suppose, for some sort of professional valuation. Um, but uh, I think sufficient uh, conservative approach to the evaluation was done at the time um, that we, we, we uh, ought to be um, on the right side of that, I think. Um, as regards the, the um, uh, rent that's, that's coming in, uh, as, as usual, uh, Councillor Shaw, you are ahead of me on, on this. You have uh, uh, fantastic ways of getting hold of this information. Um, and I, I can't respond to that. Uh, I can either, uh, leave that to uh, to our section 151 officer to provide a written response. I think that might be the best route on that, if I may. I think you're right, uh, Leader. A, a written response would be very useful, I think. And also circulate it to all the members, please. Thank you. Councillor James, followed by Councillor Harrington and Owls. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, there are two issues that uh, the, the leader has actually mentioned in here. The one is the, and Councillor Phillips brought it up, the, the need to do something about the phosphate levels in the county, in our rivers. He touched on the, part of the point about uh, sort of having grassland uh, near and uh, alongside mm -hmm. our rivers. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that, and we may try and persuade individual farmers, but I, I got grave doubts we will achieve a great deal in that direction. It requires government, through the Environment Agent, to import, imp, impose restrictions on the use of land adjoining, and uh, the, the Y and the LUG, and the team for that matter, and the, and the tributaries, throughout the county so uh, you know th let's not kid ourselves that we're going to change things in this council as regards to that ourselves majorly the other issue is the fact of housing which is going to become the most important issue I think one of the most important issues and concerns in the in this county over the next few years already I'm seeing uh, lots and lots of people from the southeast and the home counties who've come into our communities and are looking for accommodation and housing within our communities. They have a, a buying power that exceeds that substantially of local residents and local local people. And, you know, I, I, I guess that the number of houses that will be taken up by retirees and second house owners in the county will rise enormously in the coming two years thereby kept creating enormous social problems for our indigenous and, and uh, community. And it's something that we have to be prepared for. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor James. Uh, uh, as regards to phosphates, I'd add an, an extra dimension uh, for you. We, we've been asked to join a group called the River Seven Partnership, um, which, which is uh, the, the seven catchment area and um, my, my reading of that it's about economic development it's about um, draining the 
the uh, the the um, the areas around the rivers to make to have more housing and more more uh, more industrial use and more farm use, uh, which is which to my my mind is totally against what we are trying to achieve. Um, we, we could do with a partnership, which, as you rightly say, says to farmers, you know, within the first hundred meters or fifty meters of whatever a river, you 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 must plant a particular crop or have it as grassland or something like that. So. So it's it's not very helpful when this River Seven partnership is is uh, sponsored heavily by the Environment Agency. Um, so we have we have a job to, to do, I think, in, in persuading the Environment Agency. I was encouraged by the meeting we had last week with with the, the EA's contribution there, and um, the, the photographic evidence they get of, of fields and this kind of stuff. Um, so there's a kind of bit of a mixed message that the River Seven partnership is saying one thing, and maybe the meeting we had last week is saying something different. Uh, but you're right, I think it, it will take government action. It would be great if farmers were able, from a financial perspective, to, to, um, um, to, to, do, to, to uh, help the environment and all that sort of thing. And we, we have, fortunately, with, on the Cabinet uh, support, we have Peter Jimman, who, who is uh, very interested in this sort of subject and involved in, in farming. Um, the housing, yes, I agree with you, Councillor James, it's, 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 a, it's an issue. Um, again, it's a little bit linked to farming as well, isn't it? Because uh, in order to do building, you need more land. Um, in order to, someone's got to sell that land, and are farmers willing to to provide that that land? Um, so it, all these things do mix, mix together, and, and I think you're absolutely right, saying these are two really important issues for, for us, um, and they are to an extent they are macro issues, aren't they? With people wanting to come and live and live in our wonderful county. Um, the more people want to come, the more pressure it puts on housing. I mean, we could debate this for, for ages, but you're, you're absolutely right. They are significant issues, which um, you know, we as a cabinet are, are, are working with the officers to, to consider. Uh, on the housing, of course, we, we're hoping to, um, to, to uh, put up some social housing. Our plan is 1,000 houses, 250 a year, affordable housing. Um, there are some financial hurdles to be got, got across with that. We need to make absolutely sure that we're providing value for money. Um, we're not doing foolish things and, and borrowing um, money which we can't can't really afford to be um, to be borrowing. But uh, that that is a uh, uh, it, we are working on that at the moment. Uh, thank you, thank you, leader. I should have said Con Councillor Kenyon was next, and I apologise for not letting you know earlier on. Councillor Kenyon, do you have a question for the leader? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I just want to comment on Councillor James first. I think... Uh, uh, a question, please. A oh, question. yeah, yeah. I'm going to get to it, yeah. About the Indigenous and doesn't like strangers. Uh, like Kingtons, like Royston Vasey. Anyway, I'll get, I'll get on. I very much welcome um, the, the public realm um, services review because I've had concerns for this for a long, long time, probably since I've been become a councillor. I'm very sceptical about how we outsource things, but I'm even more skeptical about how we control these, how we monitor them. And um, it, it, there's been a lot of um, public concern about, well, I suppose it's brought the administration into a bit of distribute or, or, or how people feel about it, because some of the very poor decisions that have been made. Um, now, it's not necessarily the councillors' decisions. I, I actually feel quite sorry for the, some of the councillors that um, have been led by poorly trained officers. Uh, within that review, our officers, uh, they've been, in my opinion, um, over the years, various different officers have got away with things and they haven't actually taken responsibility for the actions and the things that have, that have and the money that's, that's caused the, the council to have to spend additionally. Are these officers can you, can you trained? Question. Yes, I am, I'm getting to it. Are these officers exactly. going, to, going to be retrained? Um, and when it comes to the management, the contract management of Belfort Beatty, is that team uh, again going to be moved back in house, uh, away from Belfort Beatty, and additional training given? Because I believe the contract management of that contract has been poor. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kenny. A very good question, of course. And can, and uh, the leader, no doubt you will be able to get some reply to that. Yes. Well, the the answer is yes, Councillor uh, Kenyon. Um, uh, but uh, the detail is being worked on uh, at the moment. Um, I think probably Councillor Harvey has been particularly keen on project management and developing project managers within within the council. We are we are changing the the culture in in, in there. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether anybody can provide a more 
up to date report or whether it's still, I think, probably with uh, with a section one five officer um, and possibly the monitoring officer to come up with a plan. Does any cabinet member have a more up to date um, statement on, on that? I think the point about the, the review is that the review is saying the contract is fine. It's just the way we've managed it. Uh, hasn't hasn't been very good um so we are we are working on that and like you councillor kenny and i go to council me, uh, parish meetings and people are complaining about um balfour bt i'd like to be in a position where balfour peter be balfour BT are acknowledged as being good and 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 we don't have people complaining they see that they are producing value for money and that, that'll be for the benefit of of everybody um the county the councillors everybody I think we're getting uh, a short of time, aren't we? Uh, thank, thank you. Um, so I, think, I won't say any more. I think we should thank you. I think we've done enough. Uh, Councillor Harvey wants to speak on this matter as well. Very briefly, please. Question. Well, just to come in and say that, um, you know, we're definitely going to be making sure that we're getting value for money on the. Uh, on the contract, there'll be more uh, competitive tendering going on. We'll be making sure that. Um, uh, local businesses get the opportunity to tender for small pieces of work, which hasn't been historically the case. Um, all contracts under a quarter of a million pounds have automatically gone through Balfour Beatty, and that's denied local businesses the opportunity to work for the council and for us to keep money local to, uh, to Herefordshire. So uh, we certainly want to deal with more of that. And where there are shortcomings in the way that we've been um, uh, managing the contract, absolutely, we're going to be addressing those. Um, again, it's not uh, it's not a problem of our, our making, but we're definitely going to be fixing it. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Harrington and Howells, followed by Wilding. Um, yes, it was just to respond quickly to Councillor James's concerns, and also to touch again on Councillor Phillips' concerns. There is some hope in terms of the funding, you know, for the management of land and and uh, you know, combating the pollution of the rivers uh, because the, the new agricultural bill that's been brought in to replace the subsidies from the EU actually shifts the focus on providing a way of, of farmers, um, you know, making, making money by doing act, actively um, improving uh, the infrastructure and, 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 the, and the natural environment rather than just setting land aside. So it's not doom and gloom and, uh, and uh, I'm hopeful. Good, glad to hear. Hope is always good. Howells, Councillor Howells, please. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the leader for, for a very comprehensive report. I want to pick up on some of the points Councillor Fagan made on children's services. We all know that children and adult services are such a major element of our budget and spending. Uh, and being a member of the Children's Scrutiny Committee, it's a particular interest to me of what we're doing to um, uh, make sure we cope with the demand. And we're doing some really good work. The peer-to-peer -peer report was really excellent and initial criticism, but we've now seen as something as a leader in that area because there's very little public data. Um, and that's really good to know. And the initiative on appointing a 16 plus champion and good luck to Helen in that job. But my question is about concerns that I saw raised by a recent local government association report in their magazine about children's services. And saying on the one hand, during the lockdown, some, they, the referral stopped by something like 20%. So a lot of people in need of services aren't asking for them. But in particular, and I, and I quote the, the chair of their children's services board, who says, the impact of the pandemic were far reaching. Uh, and as it becomes clear, the more children and their families are likely to need support and councils expect to see a rise in referrals in children's so, social care and demand for wider children's support services. Now, given that we know that our cabinet is very much proactive in looking forward to how we cope with things that are going to happen rather than be reacted to things that have, and I'm sure our committee will look at it, I thought it'd be really useful for the council and the public to get Lydia's overview thoughts on the impact of significant likely increases in demand and how we're preparing for it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Howells. Leader? Yes, I'll ask um, Councillor Norman to comment on, on, on that in a moment, if I may. Um, I think we've got some cultural change going on in, in, in um, both adults and children's in the council. Um, so we've got um, signs of safety, which is pretty well embedded um, in, um, in the adults section. Is that right? Um, 
No, science of safety is the new one, isn't it, in, in, the, in the children's area. And, and uh, I, having had a number of meetings with the, the person appointed to that area, I, I think uh, I just get this, the feeling that there's some enthusiasm, there's something being done differently. Um, and yes, there, there may be a bit of a, a tsunami coming towards us, but I think, I think we've got some people there who are first class and, and uh, really addressing those sorts issues uh, you're absolutely right to raise raise concerns of course the, the figures are, are hiding things at the moment i think uh, that uh, people are not raising concerns with social services which they normally would um, and it looks as if the figures are really quite good but actually there's a there's something hidden behind um Councillor norman i don't know whether you can uh, comment on that um yes thank you leader um really to agree with the points you've made, um, that it, it, there is concern clearly, and we have been worried that, um, you know, things are happening and we haven't had the full uh, eye of the community or schools or attention on possible um, concerns that might otherwise have been raised. Um, and things will come forward slowly but surely, I'm sure, um, over, you know, over time. Um, we have new innovations, as we've heard, we have new approaches to ensuring or helping to ensure the safety of our children and young people. Signs of safety has been mentioned, this new approach where we look for strength within the family and work with families. Um, and equally, um, uh, new moves like having our domestic abuse hub within MASH or alongside MASH and the early help hub will all help uh, as ways to ensure that things that we get, that we hear about that are reported are, are fully addressed. But I think the important thing uh, for us all to be um, pleased about and to support and encourage is the, uh, the move towards closer working with families, working to bring out the very best in families to work with their, the issues that they perhaps need help and support with, and really to help families to help themselves and to be, um, we know they are the best place for our children and we want to ensure that they are able to do that as far as possible. Um, Thank there's you. a lot more Thank detail you. one could go into, oh. but I think that's broadly where we're coming from and, and, and how we want to be working with our families in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Wilding, what is your question? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is just back to the subject of houses, actually, and the Council's aims uh, to build affordable houses. Uh, do you feel there's scope to look close, more closely at building smaller housing units, which uh, would be truly sustainable and satisfy the needs of uh, the housing supply uh, while not putting so much pressure on uh, our natural capital. Thanks. Leader, that's a nice mm. brief question, yes, well done. I'm sure, I'm sure that's, uh, that is absolutely right. I think um, in, in my ward, um, Sunny Klee, Klee Honga is a, is a place where the community only wants small houses. Um, uh, they're to be commended for that, that acknowledges the needs of their particular community. So I think we need to look at each community a little bit as, as it is um, and, and uh, work out what's, what's appropriate. I think you're, you're probably pointing as well towards um, environmentally friendly housing. Um, I, I'm not quite sure which figures I quite, quite believe as to, to the cost of making it um, um, uh, complying with BRIAM or, or Passive House or whatever, uh, we need to, to make sure that we, we know uh, wh what we're letting ourselves in for. Uh, longer term, it's obviously much better to be um, Passive House or whatever, but what's the, it doesn't mean then we, can, we have so many fewer houses to build. But, but that's an ongoing debate, and I know Councillor Chowns is very interested in, in that, and we are looking around to see what best practice is around the country. Thank you, Leader. Uh, Councillor Harvey, the final question, I think. Councillor Harvey, you are muted. Ah, I'm muted. Sorry, sorry, Chairman. Sorry? Um, yes, uh, question for the Leader. Um, leader, were, were you aware that um, Councillor Davis and I had a meeting with... Um, uh, Mr Lovegrove, the Section 151 officer and Councillor Shaw in an effort to um, address uh, all of Councillor Shaw's concerns about the May Lord Orchard. 
um, purchase and the the degree to which it's um, delivering on its um, on its financial um, obligations. Um, and uh, if you weren't aware, were you aware that uh, nationally uh, rent collection for um, commercial properties is um, in the area of 35 to 41 percent? whereas the rent collection at the moment in um, Maylords is at 61% and rising. Um, and the third question is, are you as tired as I am hearing Councillor Shaw's mischievous questions where he misses out the important pieces of information that he's already been given? Uh, Councillor Hitchener, the yeah. leader, you're good. <laughs> Well, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of the meeting before it took place. I was told a couple of days the meeting had taken place and I, I had the impression that uh, all counts the Shaw's concerns had been advanced and addressed. Um, so yes, I'm, I, I don't know why he, he, he needs to ask the same question uh, over again. Um, but, uh, you know, it's part, part, of, part of the, uh, the theatre of, of, uh, of this event. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Leela. Uh, Councillor Shaw, you've been named. Do you wish to respond? Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> court, court, uh, court snacking, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I need to comment that um, I, I think uh, in the interests of uh, openness and transparency that these matters are, are brought to the attention of the public. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we all shared the information you've been given then, Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Uh, I think that brings to a conclusion the leader's report and questions upon it. We thank you very much. Some interesting points made. I do ask you, though, to try and bring your questions to the forefront and not have a huge long preamble in the future. Uh, we now come to item 11, no motions on notice, pages 87 to 92. Before we commence the debate on the motions, I ask members to be succinct with their comments and to avoid repeating those points already made, so that those members who wish to speak have every opportunity to do so. And may I remind you that only the proposer of the motion has the right to speak more than once. And the motion is the decline in hedgehog population, proposed by Councillor Alyssa Swinglehurst, seconded by Councillor Nolandi Watson. So Councillor Swinglehurst, please introduce your motion and you have five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I won't take five minutes. I am mindful of the of the time. Um, I'm going to touch on the numbers cited in the in the notice of motion. Um, so the 30 million is uh, admittedly a broad estimate of, of population in the 1950s. Uh, according to the People's Trust for Endangered Species, the only credible estimate of population size, and this is from a, a study in 1995, uh, it was 1,550,000 for Great Britain, uh, with England uh, standing at 1,100,000. Um, that, that has a high degree of uncertainty, but using that as a benchmark, um, there are more firmly established rates of decline from a study in 2012 uh, to uh, lead us to the conclusion that there are now perhaps fewer than a million hedgehogs in Great Britain. A 2019 article by Acer Ecology references a decline of 37% in the last 10 years, which is a faster rate of decline than tigers in the wild. They cite the figure of 30 million in the 1950s to the current population. Scientists estimate that at this rate of decline, they will already be extinct in some areas. Either way, the hedgehog, along with 10 other native mammals, is now on the IUCN red list for British mammals vulnerable to extinction. And I find myself less interested in quantifying the loss of a species than doing something to prevent this. The decline in hedgehog numbers is uneven. In some urban areas, the numbers are thought to be stable, whereas in rural areas, this beloved British mammal is in steep decline. Uh, PTES estimates the loss of around a third from 2002 to 2017. There are a number of reasons for this in all settings, uh, but the principal issue in a rural county such as ours, according to the 2018 report, the State of British Hedgehogs, 
is the increase of intensive agriculture leading to habitat loss and fragmentation, reduction in prey availability, insect larvae and soil invertebrates such as earthworms and slugs make up a large part of hedgehog's diets and can be scarce in agricultural soils. In addition, they are killed on our roads and they have natural predators in the badger and the fox. Everything plays its part, but in combination, these things are devastating. Kay Voss, who is the CEO of uh, British Hedgehog Preservation Society, said we need government to enforce wildlife friendly practices from farming to development to transport. Wildlife needs to be taken seriously. So what can Herefordshire Council do to take wildlife seriously? So I suppose what I'm asking is for the executive to do what it can. And this may include actions I haven't thought about, uh, things that quickly outstrip the modest ask of this uh, notice of motion. We consider the humble hedgehog as a protected species in the same way and to the same extent that we consider European protected species. The executive may like to consider wider ranging measures to incorporate the other species that are on the red list. I'm just starting the conversation here. Although they have protection under Schedule 6 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which prohibits killing and trapping by certain methods, and the Wild Mammals Protection Act in 1996, Appendix 3 of the Byrne Convention, and recognition as a species of principal importance which public bodies have a duty of responsibility to protect under the NERC Act, they're still at risk. So it would be great if they could be placed on Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act or gain recognition as a European protected species, and who knows that may happen, but it's not within our gift. What I'm suggesting is that we behave as if they have that level of protection and make it a requirement for ecologists to search for hedgehogs and mitigate or enhance habitats where a development is being proposed that may have an adverse impact. Developers should ensure that gardens are hedgehog friendly highways with gaps in fencing, that there is evidence of hedgehogs on a planning development site, the impact on them is mitigated, that they are protected and that any new development incorporates hedgehog habitat where hedgehogs are known to be. Advice could be sought from the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust and incorporated in a list of recommended wildlife mitigation on development sites. A list of sensible, practical steps to do something positive, not a backed box ticking exercise. The reason I brought this forward now is that a recent planning permission in my ward was on a piece of ground where a family of hedgehogs were living. They were regularly observed coming and going from a bird feeder on an adjacent property. There was no protection for them through the planning system, and now they have disappeared. And given that this disruption happens during breeding season, there is every reason to suppose that the next generation of hedgehogs was also impacted. And I find that very sad. There is also another reason why a oh, councillor so close to Ross. Your five minutes. Thank you. Can I four lines, Chairman? Sorry? So I, I'm, all I'm asking yes. is that we, yes. we do what we can, and I know that we will. Thank you. Thank you. That's very good of you. Uh, Councillor Watson, do you wish to speak now or reserve your right until later? Um, if possible, I would like to speak now, Councillor uh, Chair. Please. Please do, three okay. minutes. My Okay, mine is uh, very brief and I would like to support um, Councillor Swinglehurst's um, logic to why hedgehogs are important and um, I have my little friend here to support me um, and bring a smile to people's, uh, to my member's face. Um, not, many, mem not many members will know that hedgehogs have actually been with us for the past 60 million years and they have not changed one eyelash for the past 25 million years. Hedgehogs have remained nomadic, nomadic foragers, whereas humans have started to settle since 10,000 years ago. Hedgehogs why is it important for us? Hedgehogs have been the ancient symbol of Ross and Wye and the business logos and family crests of the Curl family and the Abrahors. There are eight wards within um, our um, within Herefordshire Council that were known to be in an ancient kingdom of Ergen or Archenfield. And those wards are mine. So, um, Council, Councillor Swinglehurst, Jinman, Hewitt, Hitchnett, Summers, Fagan, Boldersons. 
that area was known by Anglo-Saxons as Archenfield, the land of hedgehogs, because they were known to be prickly characters, independently minded, and not following the rules of the Anglo-Saxon king at the time. They were competent archers and mercenaries right up until the 13th century and thieves not to be trusted, which is, um, and this was an area um, from 400 AD right up to 1534 when uh, King Henry VIII actually uh, moved the boundary from uh, the river right down to the Monmouthshire borders. So let's be a beacon of good practice. Um, protecting hedgehogs will en enhance our biodiversity, embeds good practice within our um, planning system and celebrates our history. So please support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Councillor. Well in time, well done. And are we also concerned that uh, Mr. Brock is predating upon Mrs. Tickywinkle? Discuss later on. Uh, we have some speakers, Councillor Tillett, Councillor Mill, Councillor Harrington, first of all. So, Councillor Tillett, off you go. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, in the mem Members Register of Interests, I am listed as a member of the British Hedgehog Preservation Society, so it will come as no surprise that I will support this motion with enthusiasm. Okay. Councillor Swinglehurst asks the really key question about these sorts of motions. Yes, it's a, it's a lovely idea, but what can we do about it? Uh, and I will offer two suggestions, um, which are both very timely and um, appropriate. Uh, after a lot of toing and froing, the government has finally decided to ban metaldehyde slug pellets with effect from next April for their sale, and the following April, a complete ban of any uh, of those products at all. Metaldehyde is a poison for hedgehogs, for other mollusk-eating wildlife, such as toads and frogs, and also for domestic pets. And even though it can be directly attributed to fairly few deaths of hedgehogs, it severely impairs their ability to breed. And for a mammal that is already suffering a catastrophic drop in its population, that is as good as killing it. So the council could make a very simple uh, lead here by a highlighting this uh, ban on metaldehyde, on making a declaration that any stocks that it may have will be stopped from use immediately and stores uh, safely disposed of, uh, that it will not wish to engage with any horticultural businesses that are still using them, and then work through its various partners um, Hereford in Bloom, through the cemeteries, uh, via the parishes with the allotments to uh, promote this ban and to encourage people to bring this ban forward in practical terms as soon as possible. A second suggestion, which uh, Councillor Swinglehurst mentioned very briefly, we all like to think of the hedgehog in our garden being our hedgehog. Sorry, folks, it's not. Uh, they travel huge distances at night looking for food and unless they are able to move from garden to garden to garden those very valuable resources for food are denied to them and Councillor Swinglehurst referred to the Hedgehog Highway project. This involves leaving a, 30 cent a 13 centimetre square at the bottom of a fence or boundary to enable passage. Again, only uh, two weeks ago, a housing developer in Shropshire announced that all further developments that they will be making will sign up to the Hedgehog Highways and will have these nominated spaces uh, in fences. We could do encourage the same. I'm not sure why Councillor Summers is shaking his head, but uh, that is something we should be encouraging through planning to benefit not just- One minute, that's why I'm shaking my head. At the end of your, Councillor Summers, be quiet, please. Uh, Councillor Tillard, you come to the end of your time. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank you. And uh, yes, an interesting and knowledgeable response. Thank you. Councillor Mill. 
The Latin uh, word for hedgehog is Erinacaeus, uh, which gave it to the name Ariconium, the Roman town at Western under Penyard, in recognition that the Romans uh, were entering a, the land of, of prickly critters, who, as Councillor Watson mentioned, were in the habit of thieving milk and fruit and eggs, and no reference to present uh, inhabitants of the Ross on Y area. Uh, and subsequently, when the Romans left, to the sub-Roman uh, and well kingdom that the Welsh referred to as Erging, and the Old English as Erkingefeld, the um, la later English as Archenfield, the land of the hedgehogs, that give us the, the word urchin in, in the colloquial English. So if we were to have a, a national uh, creature for Hereford, or Herefordshire, or at least for that part of the kingdom of Herefordshire, part of Herefordshire that um, I suspect that Councillors Watson and, and, and Swinglehurst have in mind to, to declare UDI for, it would be the hedgehog. So therefore, I'm very happy to support this motion. Thank you. A very erudite uh, interjection. Thank you. Councillor Harrington, and then followed by Councillor Kenyon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I fully support this. I, I think, the, as everyone's pointed out, the, the detail will be how we do it. But Councillor Swinglehurst is not asking us to come up with a solution today. She's asking us to commit to looking at that. So I think we can we, we can do that. And I fully support that. I, having uh, looked after two hedgehogs for six months last year over the winter, I know I know how lovely they are, but also how much they need their protection. Just one point I would like to raise, though. I'm not sure the evidence is there to suggest that badgers uh, have had a huge impact on on hedgehogs, uh, the, there is no scientific evidence presently that says that um, they obviously do predate on it. So do foxes in times of uh, in times of stress. Um, whatever the case, I think it's much more likely, as uh, Councillor pointed out, to be the reduction in habitat that's happened in the last few years. Uh, so just uh, yeah, fully support this. Thank you, Councillor Swinglehurst and, and Watson for bringing this forward. Uh, the only other thing I would suggest is that we might look to, to try and broaden this out, perhaps. And if we are going to put some resource towards this and actually try and bring in supplementary papers or adjust our core strategy at some point, which will give us the power to do things that we may not be able to do now. We might want to look at a, a total wildlife protection kit that, that goes into planning or goes into our core strategy or whatever it is. Uh, I'm, anyway, we, we support this. I, I certainly support it, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Harrington. Councillor Kenyon, followed by Councillor Shaw, Charles and James in that order. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank Councillor Harrington on behalf of all the hedgehogs for keeping the Fairnet Road closed, at least till next year. Um, so that's a well done there. Um, I think we need to take a common sense approach here. I thought when I first read this, I'll have my chain yanked. Um, it, we've got bats, we've got newts, we've got all sorts of reasons why we can't do planning. I think the very simple thing is to ask the builders to, to do this, use a common sense approach. No one wants any harm to come to the lovely in fact, Councillor Watson looks a bit like Bob Carroll G's and spit the dog there. Um, so I'm quite enjoying the puppet show. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do need to take a common sense approach. Let's not make this another boundary to stop planning. Let's, let's work with the builders to make sure they do it. That's the best way to get results. Otherwise, they'll be, they'll be carrying them off somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kenyon. Councillor Shaw, followed by Councillor Charles and James. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'd like to thank Councillors Swinglehurst and Watson for, for the motion. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to praise the work um, and dedication of zoologist Dr. Sasha Norris of uh, Herefordshire Wildlife Rescue. Uh, I don't agree with her politics, but I do indeed praise the work that she does on behalf of Herefordshire Wildlife. The rescue and rehabilitation service run by her cares for wild animals and birds and re-releasing them to the wild. And she's a regular uh, uh, re re registered hedgehog carer and thus has facilities and kit to deal with probably hedgehogs. She is uh, an inspiring teacher and speaker and I've been pleased to support her when she has spoken to local schools and meetings of my two commons associations on Brinksty Common and Bromiard Downs. We have constructed and placed hedgehog boxes and I have arranged the uh, release of uh, 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 hedgehogs there, uh, those which have been rescued and, uh, and brought back to good health. I think if the council can make small changes, 
uh, perhaps to planning policy, as is suggested, uh, to label hedgehog access to new domestic gardens, to support them in small ways, perhaps we can help to reverse the current worrying decline in numbers. At a time of gloom and doom, I, I applaud a motion that gives us the opportunity to do something positive for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. That is positive. Uh, Councillor Charles, followed by Councillor James, and then Wilding. Councillor Charles. Thank you, yes, and thank you to Councillor Swinglehurst and Watson for bringing forward this motion, and of course, I'm very much in support. Um, I really welcome the discussion that's been had today and uh, welcome the fact that there's cross-party support for more measures to uh, protect uh, our precious ecology and wildlife. Um, I think uh, Councillor Swinglehurst is right to draw attention to the fact that habitat loss is the primary cause of the decline in um, hedgehog population and indeed the decline in numerous other species as we know we face an ecological crisis and um, I think there's a link here to the debate we had earlier about phosphates because um, we, you know, the, these issues are related to agricultural practice, which in turn responds very much to incentives set by central government. And so picking up on points that others made, I think the agriculture bill and the um, forthcoming environmental land management scheme may potentially, I very much hope, uh, provide incentives that focus on public money for public goods, including nature protection. And we all need to get involved in that national level debate to ensure that they do. Um, what can we do ourselves locally? Um, I'm uh, very pleased to report to colleagues, as I think I indicated in a debate on trees in July, that um, I have asked officers to work up a nature strategy for the council, uh, which will cover trees and hedgehogs and our wider ecology as well. So this would be an equivalent to the carbon management plan that we have, which sets out what we as, as a council will do to cut our carbon emissions. I've asked for a plan for us to do the same on nature so that we ensure that whether it's about slug pellets used by, um, I, I don't know if they are, I will find out, but if slug pellets are used by any of our contractors, for example, we need to find that out and set in place a policy that will ensure that they, that they aren't going forward. Um, and I'd like to pay tribute here to the work of another voluntary group, Verging on Wild, which has worked very effectively with Balfour Beatty um, to promote um, the protection of our wild verges alongside our roads. And I think that that goes to show how uh, voluntary groups can work, you know, very constructively with the council to promote ecological protection. Um, so uh, in some, very much support this. If you have practical, um, specific suggestions about stuff you would like the council to include in our nature strategy, please do send them in. And the final point is about how we as a council can help encourage others, you know, the wider community. And of course, this links with the work of the Climate and Ecological Emergency Steering Group. Um, and one kind of, one example that I can give is that officers are currently working on an ecology checklist for planning applications, so that all planning applicants will be provided with a checklist to encourage them to do things like hedgehog holes and fences, for example. But also, Councillor Jones, you've come to the end of your time. Thank you very oh, much. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor James, then Councillor Wilding. Thank you, Chairman. Can I agree with Councillor Harrington over the fact that there is no proof that the badger has been responsible for the de decline in the numbers of hedgehogs? I've got probably one of the largest um, badger sets in the, in the county on, on my land. And I know that there are badgers where when the badgers were at their height, so were the so were the um, hedgehogs in numbers in my in my area. I think the, the the cause is probably related to the to the land and the usage on on the land, and, and principally, I have to say, the the lack of slugs uh, and uh, feeding feedstuffs for for hedgehogs. Uh, that has declined. The, the roads, well, you know, I, mean, I can go back many years where there were loads of uh, hedgehogs killed on the roads. Um, and, but unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't see them now. That's a, an indication of the decline in, in, in the numbers. I think the, the answer lies in, in what's going on the land. And it's not so much farming. I mean, the bulk of the, of the, the use of illegal, well, legal um, 
pellets, etc., are in urban gardens in the county. Very little is used in, in, in the countryside. I don't know of anywhere on a land around my area where the, those slug pellets are used other than in the gardens of, of, uh, of people. So it, it's, it, it's much more complicated than it sounds. And I wish we knew, knew what was the cause and some research done in, in the decline of those of hedgehogs. There is little, little evidence to, to, to know why it's happening. Th th thank you, Councillor James. Councillor Wilding, I think you're the last um, one. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as some people have noticed, I've had my hair cut, and it's purely so I can appear more like a hedgehog for this meeting. Um, I'd just like to say that I agree with Councillor Tillett. We could do something like uh, just ban type of slug pellets he's talking about, even if as Councillor James suggests, it's not the main problem. It would lay down a little marker and it's something we could actually do and not wait for the, the, ban, the general ban to come in in a year's time or so. Anyway, I like hedgehogs. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Wilding. I think probably most of us like hedgehogs. And uh, I hope we will now get a summing up from Councillor Swinglehurst, who has three minutes. Uh, which I which I won't debate. which I won't which I won't need uh, chairman. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for what I, well, I think it's been quite an, an erudite, interesting, and informed uh, debate on this. I would like to extend my uh, personal thanks to Councillor Watson for seconding this us prickly folk of Arkenfield. Um, it's it's it has been actually I think quite an interesting debate, and, and I think we all look, really look forward to seeing. Uh, the nature strategy as it comes forward and, and I'm glad that this has given us an opportunity to speak with one voice uh, on behalf of hedgehogs um, and give them a voice. So thank you all very much. Thank you Councillor Swinglehurst and I think we've, as you say, we've had an erudite, interesting and worthwhile debate and I hope it leads on to good things as well. Sure it will. Uh, moving to the vote, first of all the recommendation the motion on notice says, a recent study has shown that the UK population of hedgehogs has declined from around 30 million to only 1 million. Whilst it is not yet a European protected species, it is a British mammal where the population is in steep decline. And I'm calling upon our executive to please consider ways in which Herefordshire Council can include measures for adaptation, mitigation, and for the protection of hedgehogs to a level comparable to that required for European protected species. And moving to the vote, please can democratic services display the proposed motion, which they have, and the voting options for, against, and abstain have been added to the electronic voting options. The options are now on screen. If you are unable to see the voting options, please access the poll icon at the bottom of your screen. And can democratic services confirm the voting number and that all members are available and ready to vote? Yeah, and yes, the voting number is 44 and all members are able to vote now. Thank you. So please, can members vote for, against or abstain? Please cast your vote and ensure you press submit after selecting the option for which you are voting. Are all the votes in? Not yet. Well, the result of the vote is 43 4, and one has not voted. And therefore, that motion is carried with great force. Thank you very much indeed. And we look forward to having some good action on the ground as a result of that. Um, and that brings us to closing remarks. I'd like to thank members of the public and councillors for their attendance at today's meeting. I remind everyone that the next council meeting is currently scheduled for Friday, the 11th of December, 2020 at 10 a.m.
and the time is now six minutes past two and the meeting is now closed.